There we go. Hey, everybody. How's it going? Jason here from radio. Uh, thanks so much for joining. Uh, today's going to be fun. We're going to have more of a kind of educational, fun, more of a laid back sort of uh, session today. Um, in front of me, I've got a beautiful Sony XBR 65 Z9F. Um, this webinar today really came from uh, a special request from a couple of uh, viewers, actually. Um, somebody specifically asked to do a Sony flat panel with a manual calibration. We've done other uh, TVs before, like LG with the AutoCal, um, but a few of you guys wanted to see a manual calibration, so why not? Uh, the Sony 65Z9F is a very highly regarded TV. Uh, it's one that I've worked on a few times. I've actually got a private client that has three of the 100-inch versions. Um, but yeah, awesome TV. We should get some great numbers out of it. Uh, before we get started, I just I have two disclaimers, uh, the two that I always have to have. Uh, number one, if you're here to copy settings, this is the wrong webinar for you. This is a step-by-step -step instruction tutorial on how to do it, what the test patterns look like, what you're supposed to do with the test patterns, and, and those types of things. Uh, also taking a look at the software and some of the tools that I'm using. There are plenty of other websites out there who, who will calibrate a TV and publish their settings. And if you want to copy settings, you know, do that till your heart's content. It's been beaten to death since the 90s. Why copying settings is, is not the best idea. Okay, number two, um, anything that you see on camera is not going to reflect what I'm actually seeing in real life. The way the TV produces light and the way the camera takes in light, it never really works out. And you may have seen this in other videos before. So uh, before we get started, uh, I am flying solo on this one, guys. There is a question box, so feel free to type in questions, and I'll check that periodically as we go along. Um, and also, um, I'll leave some time at the end, too, for some questions. We should get through this fairly quickly, to be honest. The Sony TVs usually dial in really, really well. Um, we're going to calibrate SDR as if it's like a night mode, and then we're going to check some things in HDR. Uh, but overall, awesome TV. I'm really excited for you guys to see it. I do have a few slides just to go through, just uh, some formalities and just a, a couple of things about the TV I want you guys to see. So with that being said, uh, give me 10 seconds. I'm going to turn off this light and we'll get started. Okay, fantastic. Switch cameras. There you should have the Sony on that camera. And let me just double check the question box really quick. Make sure you guys can hear me and see me all right. Uh, Tom says, are you going to be showing AutoCal? No, specifically, we are going to do this uh, webinar uh, by request for, um, for, uh, for manual calibration. So uh, let's go ahead and flip through these couple of slides just so you guys can get a little more information about this TV and uh, a few other little tidbits. Uh, of course, I, like I said, this is an XBR uh, 65Z9F, a uh, couple years old, but still an awesome, awesome TV. Um, a little bit about Meridio, just in case you guys are, are new to us. We are a test equipment manufacturer. We manufacture um, diagnostic tools for HDMI systems. And we also make tools to do this type of calibration work. Uh, you can kind of see on the slide here, we do make several different products for different levels of uh, what you need. And you know, we even have some like lab grade tools as well. Maybe you're a manufacturer or those types of things. Maybe you're an engineer. Uh, but we're gonna be using today the 6G generator. Um, everything else on here, if you want a little bit more information like on the analyzer or the um, the uh, the Fox and Hound kit that we have, which is super popular. Uh, we do have some little 4K HDMI test monitors right now. If you guys want to see any of that stuff a little bit closer, uh, feel free to visit Meridio.com. And if you have any questions, uh, you can always shoot me shoot me a message. Uh, my name is Jason Dustel. I've been with Meridio now uh, for uh, four or five years, something like that. The time's flying. Um, I got into this business because I like it. Uh, I grew up around this stuff. My great grandfather was a TV slash radio repairman. For many years um so you know by the time i was old enough to work i knew i wanted to work in this space and here we are 20 plus years later um i've been doing calibrations for about 14 years now i've done thousands of them and it's really um it's one of my my, my favorite things about working in this industry is making these awesome tvs and projectors look very accurate and and just blowing people away with now you can see shadows and now the skin tones look correct and those types of things it's just a lot a lot of fun uh, enough about me. Um, what is calibration? Just in case anybody's new to this whole concept, uh, calibration, if we're talking in the context of, of video systems, it's using the test and measurement equipment to match the display to a known standard. So if we take a look just real quick on the, on the slides here, um, the, the, the image you see on the left is pre-calibration for, I don't remember which TV I captured this from, but uh, what you're seeing here is the entire color gamut. That's the big, we'll call it the shark fin. Inside of the shark fin, you'll see a smaller triangle 
This triangle is called Rec 709. This is what we're aiming for for you know normal standard dynamic range type content. Uh, you can see different color points here, which we're trying to hit. And uh, whatever TV I screenshotted this from, you can see the little dots and you can see how far off some of the colors are. They're, some are a bit oversaturated. Yellow's too green, red's too green, and cyan's oversaturated, magenta's way undersaturated. By the time that display was calibrated, we were hitting all of our color points. Now that's not all of it. We still have to worry about things like grayscale and gamma and those types of things, but this is sort of the gist of it. Uh, anybody that you're working with in a professional environment, whether they're film or TV or um, even photography and those types of things, everybody's using the same standard. So we're just gonna simply match this display to those known standards. Okay, so what am I gonna use today? Of course, I'm gonna use the Meridio 6G as my signal generator. Uh, I do have a Klein K10 colorimeter. Uh, we're gonna use that for the calibration. Before I started the session today, I did profile it with an i1 Pro 3. Uh, I didn't wanna uh, bore you guys to death with showing you how to do the profile. Uh, Portrait Displays has a great walkthrough on their YouTube page if you really wanna see it step by step. But I did profile it with the i1 Pro 3. Uh, today, we're gonna be using the CalMan software. Um, since this is gonna be a manual calibration, we're going to use the ISF workflow for standard dynamic range, and then we'll use the HDR manual workflow for HDR. Uh, the way Sony's typically work is once you white balance SDR, um, all of that should transfer over to HDR, and we'll see if that works today. Uh, but that, that's the idea with the Sony. A little bit about the TV I'm working on today. As I said, it's XBR 65 Z9F. Uh, firmware was updated this morning, so that's all up to date. It has about three out, 300 hours on it, 308 or something like that. And uh, it is completely reset back to the factory settings. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. So um, like I said, before we started today, I went ahead and made the profile. Uh, we've got the, uh, the Klein K10 that we're gonna use for the calibration that's been profiled with an i1 Pro 3. Of course, we also have the Meridio 6G generator. Uh, the way that is set up right now, because we're gonna do standard dynamic range first, is we got the output set to 1920 by 1080, 30 frames per second. We're gonna use 444 color space at eight bit, which is you know well within the parameters of SDR. Um, I do use full 100% window sizes on LCD, you know, LED backlit LCDs. Uh, we, we tend to do that uh, just so the TV doesn't do anything funky with like local dimming or, or anything like that. Uh, on this TV, you can actually turn the local dimming off, uh, but because it is an LCD based panel, uh, it's okay to use the uh, full 100% uh, full fields for your test patterns. Um, other than that, uh, just one thing I do like to check just to be safe, if we look in the settings for CalMan, under the third step here, application measurement options. Something that we use quite a bit for OLED panels is this pattern insertion, uh, but that's gonna, we're gonna go ahead and leave that off for this calibration because again, it is an LED LCD. Um, other than that, guys, the, the uh, CalMan's ready to rock and roll. Let's go ahead and start the session. And I'm just gonna use some kind of generic uh, values here. Sony 65Z9F and we're gonna use, just for the client, we'll just call it test. And in the display, we're gonna go ahead and put the make Sony and the model 65Z9F. Cool, and that should start the session for us. Again, uh, when I see this drop down screen for the workflow, we're just gonna use the ISF workflow because we're gonna do standard dynamic range first. So right here, ISF calibration, and now we can start the session. Take a peek over here and no questions yet. Okay, cool. Hope you guys are having a nice day. The weather down here in Florida is beautiful. I hope it is where you are too. Uh, we're kind of getting close to summer, so it's gonna start getting real hot soon. Um, depending on where you guys live, I don't know if you're up north, maybe in Minnesota or something, maybe there's still snow on the ground. I know they're having some cold snaps in Sioux Falls still. So, okay, CalMan's ready to rock and roll. Um, Front page here is just sort of a welcome screen, just kind of tells you, um, you know, hi, we're portrait displays, you're using CalMan software, and press the next button to begin. Um, before I set the session up and before we started recording, like I said, guys, I did go ahead and set everything up as far as the meter, generator, things like that. So there's not a whole heck of a lot we have to do here, so I'm just gonna blow right by this page. Meter position, it's always a good idea to try to get the meter as close to the center of the screen as you can. Uh, the way the TV is here set up on a table, I was able to get it dead center, so that's great. Um, also, that the, does give you a little bit of instruction here if you're calibrating a projector, sort of shows you to you know make sure the meter's on a tripod and a few feet away from the projector, no big deal. But since we're doing a flat panel, we're just gonna aim for the middle of the screen. Okay, pre-calibration settings. Like I said before, 
I have done a factory reset on this TV. So if we check the uh, picture mode, it should be in standard. And yes, it is. And hopefully, I don't know if you guys can see that because of the tripod here for the client, but it is in standard mode. Okay, cool. Now, since it's factory reset, I'm just gonna use standard as the picture mode and just leave all this stuff blank. If it's factory settings, it's not a big deal. I'll still leave myself a note down here at the bottom so I know it's in the factory settings. If I was working on a TV with a client who has changed some of the settings, I would go ahead and fill this stuff in, but since it's factory anyway, uh, there's no uh, nothing to really worry about there. Okay, now is where things get fun. Uh, this is the pre-calibration capture. So what we're gonna do is measure the TV as is so we know what needs to be fixed. Um, the Calman's gonna take control of the generator and the light meter. We're gonna see some readings here for the grayscale, and then we'll see where the, um, the primary and sec secondary colors land on this chart. And we'll also look at the gamma curve over here. Uh, the, cur uh, the chart down here on the bottom right is gonna show us how bright or dark each one of the primary and secondary colors is. In the middle of the screen, we have all the hard data, all the actual numbers. So when you're looking at really close things, like let's say you're trying to dial in cyan uh, and you're looking at X and Y coordinates, by the time you get it into the, by the time you get it into the box that it's supposed to be in, uh, these numbers down here will uh, help you get it really, really, really uh, as tight as you can. So, okay, cool. So we're gonna go ahead and do a read series and it looks like there's a question. So while Calman's reading, I'll take a look at the question. Oh, Thomas says, um, have you gotten your hands on the 7G generator? Absolutely, I've got two or three of them here in the Florida office. Uh, it's a great, great, great piece. Kevin says, uh, how far is the Klein from the screen? Great question. Uh, Kevin, one of the things about LCDs that most of us know from being curious little kids, um, you know, if you take an LCD screen and you press your hand against it, it tends to discolor, right? So I don't like to get these meters up against the screen enough to where we're causing that discoloration. Um, so I have the hood of the Klein. I maybe could slip a piece of paper in between the, the hood and the, uh, and the TV itself. Uh, I've got all the lights off in here, so that should be totally fine. But yeah, I don't like to get this meter uh, right up on the TV, if it's, uh, if it, especially if it's an LCD. If it's an OLED and it's touching, it's not a big deal. Okay, good question, thanks for that. Okay, now let's take a look at the pre-calibration view. Um, the RGB balance, this is the grayscale. So we're gonna look at level 10, which is almost black, all the way up to level 100, which is peak white. Um, right here at this 100 line is really what we're aiming for. And you can see right now that blue is like off the charts. Green is on the chart, but it's way low. Red is way low and off the chart as well. So quite a bit of work to do here on, uh, on the grayscale. Now, when we end up picking a different picture mode to calibrate, uh, this might be a lot closer than what we're seeing right now. And that's good for the calibrator because that means there's a little bit less work to do. Um, the gamma slash uh, luminance curve here, that's a little off too. Again, once we pick a better picture mode than the standard mode that comes from the factory, um, this might tighten up a little bit more as well. And again, we'll, we might not have to mess with it too, too much. Uh, primary and secondary colors in standard mode are kind of a mess, but that's to be expected with factory settings. You see the green's way oversaturated, yellow's oversaturated and too green. Red is oversaturated, magenta is oversaturated, and two blue. Blue is pretty close, but it's uh, not quite in the box. We can probably tighten that up quite a bit. Cyan's oversaturated and two blue, and white, as we know from the RGB balance, is two blue as well. When we look at the gamut luminance numbers, this is how bright each color is. Um, remember, guys, color works in three dimensions. So we have dimension number one is the X coordinate, dimension number two is the Y coordinate. And then we also have, if you can picture this model as like a 3D model, we also have to worry about the Z axis or how bright or how dark the color is. In video language, we don't call it Z, we call it capital Y. So we're gonna end up with three numbers at the end of the day when we measure each color or each level in the grayscale. We'll have it lowercase x, lowercase y, uppercase y. Between those three, we can tell exactly where that color lives in the color space. So if we look at the individual primary and secondary colors, the goal here is to be at zero, not too bright, not too dark. And as you can see in this standard factory picture mode, things tend to be uh, a little bit too bright. So this is not a big deal, it's all fixable. This just happens to be how this particular TV came out of the box. Okay, another question it looks like. 
Um, Jared says, should you adjust blue and red only, or can you adjust green also to bring the air down? Do you adjust green only for luminance? Great question, Jared. Um, you know, we've sort of always lived by this mantra of, you know, don't ever touch the green control with white balance. Try to use red and blue and then use green as your last resort. And I still do live by that for the most part. Um, the reason we try not to use the green control is usually because it's very, very sensitive. So, you know, if you go up like one click of green, uh, the grayscale might go super green. But if you end up taking away red and blue instead, uh, the, the change is a lot more subtle and, and you don't run into the risk of putting too much green in the grayscale. So great call out. We'll see how this TV does. But as I said before, guys, the Sony's usually dial in really well and really easily. And I'm willing to bet that we can get away with doing the grayscale with just the red and blue controls. But we'll see. Good question. Thank you for that. All right. Let's go to the next page. And now we're going to pick a picture mode. Um, if you've done Sony's before, you probably already know and have memorized which modes you're going to calibrate in. But for somebody who may have not seen this before, what we're really looking for here is I need to pick a picture mode that gives me the most freedom or the most amount of adjustments. If you look at a picture mode like vivid or dynamic, not only are they way too bright, way too oversaturated and all those other things, but in a lot of those cases, all the good settings that we need to calibrate this TV are, are grayed out. So some of these picture modes are kind of useless for calibrators. Uh, they're great for retail environments and things like that, but to calibrate the TV, if all my settings are grayed out, that's not gonna get me very far. So the whole goal here is regardless of the manufacturer and model number of the TV or projector or whatnot, is to pick a mode that gives us the most adjustments. Now the Sony's, I know them pretty well. If you guys have worked on Sony's uh, yourself, then uh, we typically are going to use either the cinema mode or the custom mode. Uh, in both cases, what I like about those modes, the white point is a lot closer than what we're seeing in standard mode. The primary and secondary colors are probably gonna be a little bit closer too. So just by picking, picking the right picture mode, that's gonna give you one, the freedom to calibrate the death out of it if you want to, and two, it's a better starting point. So, you know, if it were me and I'm running a race and I had the option to start in the middle versus the starting line, I'm gonna pick the middle, right? It's going to be a lot easier to do and we're gonna get through it a lot quicker as well. Looks like another question came in. Let me grab that real quick. Um, I remember when I was trained, we were always testing windows. Um, also too, Thomas says, are you running full windows for these test patterns? Yes, absolutely. Uh, again, it's an LED LCD. Uh, we're gonna use full frame or 100% windows as the test patterns. Good question. Okay, so first let's go through the picture modes. Um, let's see here. I hope you guys are going to be able to see this. I've got a better camera recently, so I think this is going to show up fairly well at least. So if we look at the different picture modes here, we have standard, cinema, game mode, graphics mode, photo mode, and then custom mode is the last one. So let's just do a couple of sort of, uh, let's do a couple of experiments here just so we can see. Uh, let's pick cinema mode first. So this is cinema mode, bone stock hasn't had anything done to it at all. This is just the factory cinema mode. So I'm gonna do a read series here and what we're looking for is the uh, the CCT, otherwise known as the correlated color temperature. Uh, for those old school calibrators out there, you might recognize things like 6,500 Kelvin. Uh, this is really just to get us in the neighborhood of proper white. Um, so I'm looking for a color temperature that's gonna be close to this yellow line. We're also going to aim for a gamma based on the room that I'm in. So we're gonna look for that yellow line uh, here as well. Now in this room, uh, it's completely dark. I've got all the lights off and I'm sitting very close to the TV. So a 2.2 um, might not be appropriate. If this room had some lights and I was sitting far away from it, uh, I probably would use 2.2. But if I wanted be reference at 2.4 or BT1886, those curves are almost exactly the same. That's very appropriate for a, for a darker room and for somebody who might sit kind of close. So one thing I need to do is I need to change that target from 2.2 to 2.4. So we'll go up here into the settings wheel. First option is workflow basic options. You can see right now the gamma is set to a power, a power formula of 2.2. So let's change that to 2.4. And now we should see the yellow line, AKA the target, move up to 2.4, perfect. So I want my levels here to hit close to the yellow line and also close to the yellow line on the gamma as well. So let's do a read series and see how close cinema mode is. 
Wow, okay, so um, a little cool, um, instead of right around 6,500, we're around 7,300 or so, so it's probably gonna be a little bit on the blue side, uh, but not the end of the world, better than what it was before, and the gamma came in at 2.2 when we're aiming for a 2.4. One thing to remember on this page specifically is that CalMAN only takes two samples to get you in the neighborhood. We're gonna see this stuff in much deeper detail as we advance through the workflow. So one thing I wanna check here is the custom mode to see if it's any different. So let's go into the menu and let's change the picture mode over to custom. And there it is right there. Okay, let's take a look at custom mode. Uh, one cool trick about CalMAN that I like is you can open up multiple tabs if you're reading multiple things. So under history one here, I can right click, I can rename it and say cinema. And then I can open up a second tab here and we can name that custom. And then it's very, very easy then to compare the two. You just have to toggle between, between the tabs. Okay, so let's see what custom mode looks like. I'm going to predict that it's very close to the same, but let's see. Yeah, a little bit better, actually. Cool. So the white point's about the same. Uh, it's creeping over the yellow line, which typically means it's a little blue, but the gamma is much better in custom mode. We'll look at some settings later to maybe see if we can get it a little bit tighter. Um, and again, this is only two samples at 60% and 100%. We'll see this in more detail, and we'll look at the entire grayscale and how the gamma is performing a little bit later in the workflow. Okay, looks like there's another question. Uh, Thomas says, is that true for OLED also? Um, I'm assuming you're talking about the window sizes. Uh, with OLEDs, you always wanna use 10% windows. Uh, OLEDs do some funky stuff with dimming when, um, uh, when using the, uh, the, uh, the full fields. So um, we definitely want to use 10% windows on the OLED and we will most likely use 10% windows in HDR on this TV as well. We'll see it, we'll see how the numbers look. But thank you for the question. So if I'm gonna choose between custom and cinema, you guys let me know. I mean, I'm gonna choose custom. That makes the most sense to me. The gamma is a little bit closer. Custom mode is gonna have all the settings I need. I think we're gonna go with custom. Now, there may be an opportunity if you're if you're a calibrator and you're dealing with somebody who has a TV in a room that might be sometimes dark and sometimes bright, you know, there's an opportunity there to calibrate a day mode and a night mode for SDR. Uh, and in, in some cases, I always use my own uh, system at home as an example. Um, my system at home, I pretty much only watch in the dark and I've got that room fairly blacked out. So the wall behind the TV is black I love it because the, the bars on 235 content, the bars disappear, which I think is kind of cool. Plus the back, the black wall behind the TV does give it a little more pop and a little more contrast. So like in my system at home, there's really no need to calibrate a, a day mode. And that might be the case if you're a calibrator, I'm sure you've run into this many, many, many times. Uh, just for the sake of time and considering this room is very dark and I'm sitting very close, we're just gonna go ahead and stick with a night mode for SDR. But if we're talking about doing a day mode for SDR, the process is exactly the same. You just have different targets that you're aiming for because the room is different. Okay, let's check the question box. And uh, Thomas says, do you think some of the new features and focuses on highlights and features and processing could cause problems for taking measurements? Absolutely, Thomas, there are certain things in the TV um, certain things like um, uh, the ambient light sensor, which you always want to turn off. Uh, we've seen things that uh, some manufacturers like to do to boost the contrast, and they'll use things like a, they'll call it something like a contrast enhancer, and, and all these different things that the manufacturers try to throw in there. 99% uh, of that stuff we turn off. Uh, but yeah, because some of those, uh, I call them bonus features, some of those bonus features can definitely throw off some of the readings, and your calibration is not going to uh, turn out the way you expect it to. Okay, so I'm more comfortable with using custom mode. The gamma target at least is a little bit better, uh, and I know custom mode is gonna have all the settings that I need. Okay, let's go to the next page. Uh, okay, so this page is uh, is really helpful, if especially if you're working on a TV for the very first time, and you know maybe you've never seen this brand before, maybe you've never seen this model before. Totally acceptable to, to use this page. Now, we already, we already know a little bit more about this TV. We put it in custom mode and the white point was a lot closer. 
a lot of TVs, and this one included, you can actually change the color gamut inside of the menu. So the last thing you want is a color gamut that's wrong based on our targets. So in a lot of TVs, you might see the color space as wide or normal or extended. In some cases, the TV might actually call out the color gamut. So it might actually say Rec 709 or Rec 2020 or P3 or, or those types of things. So the whole point of this page is to make sure you're starting off in a close white point or close color temperature and to make sure you're starting off in a close color gamut. Um, what we don't want to have happen here is uh, like in standard mode that everything's oversaturated and, and that type of thing. The triangle can be too big. What happens if the triangle is too big? All of your standard dynamic range content is going to look way oversaturated. You're going to get orange skin tones and neon green grass when you're watching sports and, and that type of thing. So let's just take a quick reading. I'm sure it's going to be close just based off of what I've seen before in these TVs. So yeah, the white's a little blue, the red's close, the green's a little oversaturated, cyan's a little blue, magenta's a little blue, yellow's a little oversaturated and a little bit green, and red's a little oversaturated too. But guys, if I had to compare the two between the standard mode here, where everything's way out of whack, versus here, That to me is a much, much, much better starting point. So you guys can see just by picking a better picture mode, you make some huge, huge, huge improvements. And this, this happens to me all the time. If you guys are integrators or calibrators or even enthusiasts who are really into this stuff and you know, you're that smart friend to your friends and family, um, I get people all the time that are like, hey man, I just bought this TV. Um, you know, it, it was 500 bucks, it was a good deal. Um, what, what are some things I can do to it you know, out of the box without having to pay for a, you know, full calibration that takes several hours. Um, and I tell a lot of people, I'm like, you know, number one, let's find a better picture mode. And just by doing that, it's going to help the accuracy immensely. Um, from there, there are some very simple test patterns that an end user could use to get things like the black level and the white level correct. So one of the first things I tell people is turn off all the energy savings. That's choking out the, the display as far as luminance goes. We also don't want the TV fluctuating in brightness with different scenes. It's very annoying. So turn off all the energy savings, put it in a better picture mode, and those just two things right there are going to help quite a bit. But you guys can see that the proof is in the pudding, right? Just by putting it in custom mode, we're already a lot closer. Okay, another question. Jared says, uh, is the color space page available in Calman Home? Jared, to be honest, I'm not sure. I haven't seen Calman Home all that often. Uh, it might be. Uh, if not, you can still do this same test with like the pre-calibration page. So for example, if we were in the pre-calibration page right here, you could do a few different things here that'll give you the same data, the same information. So history one was standard mode. I could open up another tab, I can name that cinema and take a reading. Open up another tab, name that custom, take a reading. Open up another tab, take a reading of vivid, for example. So then you can just flip between all the tabs watch the charts over here and you can see exactly what's going on with the color gamut. So even though that page is in Calman in the ISF workflow, uh, it's a little repetitive uh, if you know how to do it here. So usually I end up skipping that page, but I just wanted to double check just to be safe. Okay. Now the next page I think is gonna answer Thomas's question for the most part. Uh, turn off all the extra bonus features is basically what this is telling you. Um, any kind of like auto light sensors, any kind of contrast enhancers or black level enhancers or color boosters. And, you know, we've seen some really wacky things over the years. And, you know, it's, I get it. It's consumer stuff. They're trying to sell TVs and bright showrooms and that type of thing. So, you know, they put a lot of these bonus features into these consumer TVs. What's really funny is you don't see that kind of stuff in professional models because they know they're not going to they know they're not going to use it. So it's not a bad idea at this point to kind of flip through the menu and uh, make sure all these things that could damage the accuracy is, is actually turned off. Oops, wrong menu. So we're going to go into the display menu and then into the picture menu. And we're already in custom. So I'm just going to scroll down here and see if anything uh, extra is turned on. Automatic picture mode is turned off. Light sensor is turned off, fantastic. Brightness, contrast, gamma, black level. Local dimming is on medium right now. Uh, extended dynamic range, this is one of those things I was mentioning, that's already turned off. Um, nothing in color to turn off. Live color is already turned off. 
If we go into the clarity menu, let's see what we've got here. We've got a sharpness control, reality creation, which I'm just gonna turn that off for now. We might use it later, I doubt it, but let's at least turn it off for now. Uh, noise reduction off, digital noise reduction off, smooth gradation is set to low. I am gonna turn that off for the session, but smooth gradation is one of those things that I do think really legitimately helps. It helps with banding, especially in backgrounds and shots of maybe a solid blue sky, or if you're watching things like Mad Max or The Martian, they have a solid orange sky. That smooth gradation feature uh, tends to smooth some of that stuff out quite a bit. Um, I find that the low setting does the least amount of damage, but also helps a lot. Uh, anything more aggressive than that, you start to see some other weird things. So I will leave it off for the, for the calibration and most likely turn it back on at the end. The next menu is the motion menu. Uh, this is something that we definitely want to make sure is uh, is set accordingly. Um, now, I'm not going to sit here and tell you guys turn it off every time. Um, if we're going for director's intent and 100% accuracy, yeah, you do want to turn that off. But you're not always going to be in a professional environment or a studio environment where that type of detail is super, super, super critical. Uh, in a lot of cases, especially with a TV like this, you're dealing with it in an end user's home. Um, if, if you're an, an end user yourself, this might be something you want to experiment with. So motion flow is the motion interpolation. And we've heard these, uh, we've heard these comments over the years where people will say, wow, I got this new TV and the motion looks too smooth. Like it looks like a soap opera, which is where the soap opera effect comes from. I've had people call me before and say, hey, why does it look like everybody's rollerblading on the screen on my TV? Because things can be overly smooth, right? So I'm kind of a purist myself, so I tend to leave this off. But if I'm dealing with an end user in their home and they're the ones who have to watch this TV, I'm not going to tell them how to watch it. I might give them a few examples of with it on and with it off and sort of let them choose. Uh, but, you know, on my own TV at home, of course, this is turned off. But in a professional environment, this will be turned off. But don't just go willy-nilly turning it off every single time. It might actually help some things. I'll give you an example. I watch a lot of stand-up comedy. I always have since I was a little kid. And Netflix now has tons and tons of good stand-ups. So does Amazon. And most of that stuff, especially on Netflix, not 100% sure about Amazon, but definitely on Netflix, all of their content now is 24 frames per second, even stuff that you would normally see as a TV show like a stand-up comedy. So you know, think about this. If you're really big in a cinema, you know that there's juddering issues when you pan left to right in 24 frames per second, or right to left, of course. So you have a stand-up comedian walking across the stage, left and right and left and right, and it looks juddery, right? So on my own TV at home, I might find like the lowest setting for this when I'm watching a stand-up comedy. Boom, it helps to smooth this a little bit. When I'm done watching that stand-up, I might turn it back off again. So again, if you're a purist, if you're calibrating for somebody else and they're a purist, this is one of those things that you're gonna end up turning off. Okay, let's see what else is in here. Uh, the Cinemotion, that's two, three pull down. Um, that's actually a good thing. If we're watching 24 frames per second content, this will help smooth things out a little bit. Three, two pull down is actually really cool technology. It's been around for a really long time. We've been watching 24 frames per second films and, and things like that on TVs now um, that are either, you know, depending on how far, far back you go, 30, 60, or 120 frames per second. So that kind of stuff does help, uh, especially if you're watching a lot of film-based content. Uh, the options here are auto, let's see what else, auto, off, and that's it, <laughs> just auto and off. So I'm just going to leave it on the auto setting. Okay, cool. Let's see what's next. There's a video signal submenu. HDR mode is auto, which means the TV will play HDR when it's showing HDR. Uh, HDMI video range, that's also set to auto. There's a couple other options here, full and limited. Um, I like to leave the newer TVs on auto because they're smart enough to know what's coming in. Um, if I hook up a PC to this TV and use it as a computer monitor, that uses full range. If we're using it as a video display, it's limited range. So you can't really expect an end user, especially an end user, to go in and change this based on whether they have their computer hooked up or based on whether they have a Blu-ray player hooked up. So luckily these days on this TV specifically, especially, the auto setting is, is a good way to go. There's also an option for color space. I sort of mentioned this before. There's an auto color space. There's B 
BT709, also sRGB, uh, DCI, Adobe, BT2020, and that's the end of the list. So again, the newer TVs, they're smart enough to where if I put this TV in auto and I send it Rec 709 SDR content, the TV's smart enough to say, oh, this is SDR, so we're gonna use SDR for our HDMI, uh, I'm sorry, for our HDR mode, and it's Rec 709 coming in, so we're gonna map out to Rec 709. So using the auto settings on these, totally appropriate, totally cool. Um, other than that, at the very bottom, we have advanced color adjustment. Uh, this is where we're going to get into things like white balance and uh, color management, which we'll do a little bit later in the workflow. Uh, let's see if there's any other menus that we may have missed. Just want to double check, triple check, and let's see here, display and sound. There's also a screen submenu um, with some things that are related to aspect ratios. Uh, we'll get to this in a couple of pages in the workflow, so I'll leave it alone for now. And let's see if there's anything else in here that we missed. There's also a sound menu, which, you know, we don't really need here today for what we're doing. And then it looked like there was one more menu that had something to do with audio. Let's see, let's see. Oh, audio output. Okay, not worried about that stuff today. We're just going to concentrate on the picture. Cool. So we're in a great starting point, guys. We're in a really good picture mode. It has all the adjustments we need. The targets aren't all that far off as they are. I think... I think we're going to get through this fairly, fairly smoothly and fairly efficiently. And you know, the the newer Sony's, I I kind of expect this stuff these days. They've been doing a really, really good job lately. I remember older Sony's, you know, going back four, five, six, seven years, and even further back than that, they never had color management. And it was always like, guys, we want we want to fix the primary and secondary colors. Give us some color management. And they finally did a few years ago. So you know, kudos to them. I love the fact that they're giving us uh, the more advanced settings now. They also added a couple of years ago to their nice, um, to their nicer uh, TVs, uh, a multi-point white balance. So uh, instead of just doing a two-point, if there's still some errors in the grayscale, you can pop over to the uh, to the ten-point, or depending on the TV, maybe even a twenty-point. Uh, Jared says that the video signal seems to be frozen. I am moving my hands around right now. You guys tell me if that's frozen or not. Okay, Tom says we're good. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Alexi has a question, more of a tip for everyone. Sony has a service menu and you can display all current settings on its page. It's very useful to cross-check. Alexi, that's an awesome, awesome tip. Uh, thank you for calling that out. Uh, Alexi, if you want to, man, um, uh, yeah, I was gonna say, well, since it's service menu type stuff, I don't wanna do that today just to save time. Uh, if you guys are interested in that though, there's tons of information on how to get in the service menu online now i will say this before before i recommend going into the service menu typically i don't recommend going into the service menu it's really really easy to brick the tv uh, if you don't believe me go on google and type in samsung hdmi calibration failure uh, people have broken many 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 samsung tvs because they're monkeying around in the service menu so before you go in the service menu know exactly what you're doing exactly what buttons to press and exactly what buttons not to press uh, the service menu can be useful for things like what Alexi called out. And we used to always have to go to the service menu to get to the white balance adjustments and, and things of that nature. So, you know, these days, you know, for the past, mm, shoot, seven, eight, nine, gosh, 10 years probably, um, we haven't really had to go to the service menu all that often. Uh, there are some instances where you might want to uh, turn off automatic brightness limiters and OLEDs. Uh, maybe you have to activate day and night modes on a Samsung. Uh, but the, the good news is, is that as far as making adjustments to the TV, uh, those days are pretty much over. I know some calibrators out there like to do the white balance adjustment in LGs in the service menu, and that's totally fine. But like I said, just make sure you know what you're doing, what buttons to push and what buttons not to push. The last thing you wanna do is break your TV or, or break a customer's TV. Uh, Tom says, my old XBR CRT, oh my gosh, Tom. I, I started calibrating at the tail end of CRT, and to be honest with you, I'm very happy that I didn't have to really work on any of them. Um, putting a screwdriver into a potentiometer next to a 50,000 volt cathode ray tube sounds a little sketchy. So luckily for me, I never really had to do any, any, um, any CRTs, so cool. All right, guys, keep those questions coming in. Uh, Jared says again that the screen is frozen. Um, I'm not sure what might be going on there. Maybe it's on his end, but everything looks okay on my end. Uh, Nick from our marketing department, I know you're on here too, Nick. If something does freeze out or you guys lose my audio, just 
feel free to let me know. Okay, cool, let's move on. Okay, this page, disable all the auto features. We went through and turned off all the bad ones. Let's go to the next page. Okay, adjust luminance. Here's where we're gonna start actually making adjustments. Now, um, this can be quite controversial. Um, there, there's a, there's a, a whole lot of folks out there who come from the professional world and the broadcast world. Um, those displays in those environments are calibrated to 100 nits for SDR. And to be honest, that works if you're in a really dark room and you're sitting pretty close to the TV. Think about how a studio, maybe a guy doing color grading work, think of that environment. It's pitch black, they have a bias light behind the screen, so it doesn't strain their eyes so much and helps them pull out a little bit more contrast from the screen and colors pop a little bit better and stuff like that. And they're, you know, they're, you know, maybe a foot away from the screen. So 100 nits, you know, it really goes back to tube TVs. Everything was graded to, to 100 nits or, you know, we were dealing with foot Lamberts at the time. Of course, they're interchangeable, but you need to know the conversion. So uh, we're 34 foot Lamberts slash uh, 100 nits. Now, 100 nits still works really well. Um, my SDR mode at home is about 120 nits. And the only reason I went a little bit more than 100 is because I'm about seven feet away from the screen. So I didn't want it to be too dim just because of the distance. So I went a little bit higher. I went to about 120. Um, but here's the good news, guys. You can kind of do whatever you want. It's a judgment call, especially if you're in somebody's home. I live here in Florida. I'm in St. Petersburg. I live downtown. I've got a lot of clients who live in these penthouses and, and high rises with lots and lots of windows. I've got some clients that are on the beach. You know, I, I can't calibrate the TV to 100 nits in those environments. I might have to go max on the backlight on a TV like this Sony, that might be three, 400 nits. And you know what? If I have to fight the sun because I'm at a beach house, I'm gonna do it. The night mode obviously will, will not be so, uh, so bright, but the standard and the reference is 100 nits. But again, that's studio environments, pitch black rooms, and those types of things. If you have a client or maybe you yourself are in a pitch black room and you tend to sit pretty close to the TV, 100 nits might work out just fine. But again, it's a judgment call. I go a little bit brighter on my own TV at home and most of my customers as well, just because I don't want them to come back and say, oh, I like it, but the picture's too dark. Last thing I want. Okay, looks like another question came in. Um, Jared says that the video's coming in and out. So, hmm, um, Jared, I'm not sure what's going on there, man. Other other people are saying it's okay. Maybe, uh, maybe come out of the webinar and maybe hop back in. Worst case scenario, um, if the freezing is getting really annoying, I would totally understand if it did. Um, I'm recording this and we're gonna throw it up on YouTube uh, tonight or tomorrow. So if you need to go and it's giving you some problems, then that's totally fine. Uh, Jared also asks, if you calibrate to 120 nits and turn the backlight up, should you turn up the backlight and then calibrate brightness? Um, so good question. If you calibrate to 100 nits and you turn up the backlight, what does that do? Um, I've seen it do a lot of weird things, desaturate colors, um, depending on how the brightness control works or the, or the backlight control works, that might mess up your black levels a little bit. So it's always a good, a good idea that if you are gonna use a, a higher or a lower backlight value to just double check all that stuff just in case. Now, of course, if you're doing a day mode and a night mode, it's not really relevant because they're calibrated differently. But if you're in a night mode and you just go crank up the backlight, it might do some really wacky stuff. So I don't know if I would quite recommend that. Um, but, you know, feel free to experiment and see what happens on your TV. Okay, no more questions for now. Awesome. Okay, so um, we're going to take these readings live because we're going to adjust the backlight in real time. So there's a really cool little button down here called continuous reading. And we're just going to see where it's at right now. Wow. So <laughs> as I said before, if I'm in a beach house or a condo with tons and tons and tons of light, I might need to go this aggressive. Um, for a dark room and the fact that I'm sitting maybe two feet away from this TV, that is probably going to cause some major headaches. And uh, I don't like looking at the sun and I don't like staring straight into a flashlight. So this is basically what's going on right now. Uh, 475 nits is a ton of power. So let's see how much we have to come down to get that closer to maybe that 100 to maybe 150-ish range. So let's see, we're gonna go into the menu here. What's really interesting about the Sony, um, they started doing this a couple of years ago and it's funny because I, they're now using the correct terms 
but if you've calibrated for a while or played with TVs for a while, it seems backwards. So what they've done is, and I've taken this phone call a million times from calibrators who are like, what is going on with these names of these settings? But they've actually got it right, but it's confusing. So we have a brightness control right here in the menu. And for as long as we've been calibrating consumer TVs, brightness has always been the black level. Sony language, these days, the brightness is the backlight. In that same menu, if we go down a couple of clicks, we have black level. So they've actually got the names technically correct, but if you're not used to it, it can be a little confusing. Most TVs call what Sony calls the brightness, they call it a backlight. So you go in, you crank it up, crank it down, figure out what you want to do. And then you go adjust the brightness, and in Sony language, it's black level. So if you do run into a newer Sony, if you haven't done one before, just be cautious of that. Right now, the backlight slash brightness level is set to 35, and that's giving us you know, 470 nits. So let's see. I do like to do this too. This is just my own curiosity. I like to crank it up and see how bright it can go. It's kind of like when you're driving a car and you want to see how fast it can go, so you smash the gas pedal. So guys, we're pushing 600 nits, which is a ton of power, uh, which says a lot about this TV and what it's capable of. That's 600 nits in SDR. So I really can't wait to see what kind of numbers we get in HDR. But this is way too bright for this environment, so let's turn it down. It was at 35, let's go down to about 20. Gosh, we're still at 330 nits. Let's go down to about 10. Okay, 211, 210, we're getting closer. Let's go down to about five. Okay, now we're in that 100 to 150 range. Let's go down to one, or minimum actually. At minimum, we're at 76 nits. So even for a studio, perfect environment, that's too dark. At one, we're at 90 nits. At two, we're right at 100 nits. At three, 115 or so. At four, 130 or so. At five, 143. Let's go up to maybe six. There we go. We probably are gonna lose a little bit of luminance throughout the process. So I'm gonna overshoot just a little bit. If I'm going for 150, I might set this at this point to 155, 160, 170. Um, there's other things that can make the TV a little bit darker later in the workflow. Good example, let's say the grayscale is way too green or way too blue. Well, we're gonna take out blue and that tends to make the TV a little bit darker. So I like to aim a little higher than my target. We're gonna double check this at the end anyway. This is just sort of a ballpark thing. I don't need 600 nits and I don't want it to be 76 nits. So we're gonna settle here right about 160 or so. Okay, let's see what's next. Let's stop the meter, go to the next page. All right, the most important page in the workflow is dynamic range. Uh, the reason I say that, I'm not making it up, I'm not guessing, this isn't based on a gut feeling, this is not a hypothesis. Our eyes are more sensitive to contrast than anything else. So if you don't get the black level and the white level and the gamma and all those related things, if you don't get those right, you're gonna end up with maybe clipped whites, you're gonna end up with maybe crushed blacks, you're maybe gonna end up with whites that are too dim, you're maybe gonna end up with blacks that are too gray. So these two adjustments are absolutely essential to get right. Luckily, the test patterns are easy, and throughout the process, at the end of the calibration, we're gonna double check this one more time as well. So what we're looking for here, I'm gonna go ahead and click the contrast. I'll do the contrast first. It doesn't matter which one you do first because you're gonna bounce back and forth a couple of times. It looks like there's a question. Let's grab that really quick. Um, Jared says, do you adjust the contrast and brightness before the calibration? That's part of the calibration. Uh, if you're talking about maybe before the really in-depth stuff like the white balance and the color gamut, you're gonna actually do contrast and brightness before, which we're about to do now, and once more again at the end. So hopefully that answers that question. Uh, I'm gonna start with the contrast, and wow, the new camera is actually picking this up pretty well. Good job, Sony, nice, nice little Sony camera. So what are we looking for here? At the bare minimum, we should see right in the middle, boxes 235, 236. 235 is the ceiling when we're talking about regular video signals that are in SDR. What does that mean? When we're looking at 8-bit video signals, there's 256 available steps. Computers use the full range. 
TVs and video products don't. In TV and video, we're looking at a value of 16 for black and 235 for white. Here's the good news. A lot of TVs like this Sony will show above 235. So right now I can see up to about like 251. If I really try hard and squint, I can see 252. That's okay. Here's why. If you're watching, say, a football game and you see a white jersey, maybe they're playing outside and the sun reflects off that white jersey just right, you might have some whites above 235. It's just how it is. When you're watching live TV especially, you're at the mercy of that environment. And if they're playing outside and there's clouds passing by the sun and things like that, there's nothing they can do about that. So you might have some stuff that's above 235. And in fact, what's hilarious to me is that if you read the, the standard, if you read the, the, the rule book or the Bible, I, I could say, of standard dynamic range rec 709, it says in video that is 16 to 235, and listen to this verbiage, it's so funny. It says, white is 235, but may occasionally excurs above 235. They didn't give us a number, they didn't give us anything. They just basically said, hey, there might be some stuff over 235 sometimes. So if it's there, I'd like to see it if I can. Um, I can see up to box 251, like I said, almost 252. Maybe, maybe we could lower the contrast, like maybe a click or two, and maybe we can gain those last couple of boxes. Now, if I turn the contrast down two, three, four, five clicks, I'm not getting any more boxes, I'm not gonna do that. I don't wanna lower the contrast and lower the dynamic range of the TV just to gain one or two little boxes at the top that are way, way, way up into the top end of the headroom that they give you. So let's just check. I don't know what's gonna happen, let's see. I believe contrast is under the brightness. Um, another thing I'll point out too, talking about menus and names and verbiage. For the longest time, and I know some of you guys who've been doing this for a while, I know Greg's on here too, Sony used to call their contrast control picture. So yeah, that wasn't confusing at all, right? They've changed that now over to contrast, which is cool. Uh, let's check this out. It's at 90 from the factory for this picture mode. Let's lower it like one, two, three clicks. Okay, now I can see 252 easily, and I can really start to make out 253. I can't see 254, and I definitely can't see 255. Why can I not see 255? 255 is peak white, and it's actually the background. So there's no physical little box here. I really should see a difference if in a, in a perfect scenario, a box at 254, and there's some difference between 254 and the background. That's ideal, but we can't seem to gain 254. Now, if I turn the contrast down to 80, I can see 254. But I don't like the idea of turning the contrast down 10 clicks just to gain two boxes. If I can turn it down one, two, three clicks, gain a couple boxes, not a big deal. But remember, the, the more you lower, the more you lower the contrast, excuse me guys, I just had a my little secondary camera just fell over. Uh, luckily I didn't break it. Um, if you lower the contrast, that lowers the dynamic range. If you raise the black level, that lowers the dynamic range. So we want the contrast to be as high as possible without any clipping or distortion or color shifting. One thing I will say about this TV, which I really enjoy, it doesn't color shift. What is a color shift? When you turn up contrast, what you're really doing is you're pushing the red and green and blue subpixels together. If one of those subpixels runs out of gas, you're left with the leftovers. So on a lot of TVs, if you turn up the contrast too high, you'll actually start to see these boxes go from white and gray to maybe like cyan looking or maybe pink looking. Uh, which is no good, right? It's it's at a point where it's about to clip. Uh, clipping itself is just uh, too much white level. Think of it in audio, it's distortion. Um, if we have the white level too high, then we're gonna lose a bunch of boxes and now we can't see details in the bright parts of the picture. So uh, a good middle ground here is seeing as many boxes as you can without really distorting the image and without lowering the dynamic range too much. Again, I came down two clicks to 88 that did pull out 252 a little bit better, and it did help me see 253. Again, I'm being a little picky here over two clicks, but I like it, I'm gonna stick with that. Looks like there's a question. 
Jared says, is 235 not the goal? Again, Jared, the white paper and the Bible of Rec 709 SDR says that there is some stuff above 235. Now, should there be, and if things are mastered correctly, no, 235 should be the ceiling, but that's not reality. Uh, we do see some stuff over 235. One little tidbit I'll give you though. Um, if I'm dealing with a projector and a screen, and maybe the screen's too big, maybe the projector is not powerful enough to light up that big screen, maybe there's a lot of ambient light in the room, uh, maybe the uh, walls are really bright and the ceiling's painted white and those types of things. If I have to turn the contrast up to get more light, then I'm really going to aim for 235. So if I can turn the contrast up on a projector and gain a whole bunch more dynamic range and still clip at like 235, 236, I'm 100% of the way going to do it. Now in the, in the world of OLED and, and LED LCDs and flat panels, if I need a brighter picture, I can turn the backlight up or the OLED light up. But in a projector system, if I already have the lamp on its highest mode and I'm still not getting the light output that I want, yes, I will turn the contrast up so the white level clips right at 235 or 236. Hopefully that answers that question. If not, feel free to follow up. Okay, we looked at the contrast. Now let's look at the brightness. Now I'd be really, really shocked if you guys can see this in the camera, but oh my gosh, you might actually be able to and you can actually see a window from all the way across the office. Okay, so what are we looking for here? As I mentioned before, in standard dynamic range, 8-bit video, uh, the range goes from 16 being black to 235 being peak white. Now, as I showed you the contrast before, it's a little loosey-goosey, right? You can be over 235 if you need to or want to. You could be all the way up to 254 if you need to or want to, um, it, it, and it's sort of, a judgment call based on room lighting and all the things we just talked about. Black level is not so loosey-goosey. It is a dead set. Here's what you should see. You shouldn't see anything else. You shouldn't see below this. Uh, and, and that's because with black level, you know, 16 is black and there are no other, you know, it may excurs here, it may excurs there. These are set in stone. So what we want to see here, uh, as I mentioned before, 16 is black. And you can see 16 right here in the very middle of the test pattern. Next to 16, we have 17. To the left of 16, we have 15. So 15 and the entire bottom row are what we call below black. So those are the levels that we don't want to see. If I crank up the black level control, it's like, oh, great, now I can see all the boxes. But now look at 16, which is the background. It's super, super gray. And all of the boxes above the middle are super, super gray as well. So this isn't one of those things where, yeah, turn it up and you'll see more boxes. That's great. That's actually the opposite of gray. This destroys your dynamic range and all of your blacks and, and, and shadows and stuff start to look gray. Our eyes hate that stuff. The, the analogy I always like to use is if you take a black Metallica t-shirt and wash it 40 times, it's not black anymore. In fact, it's not black after one washing. So we want to keep black as black, but we still want to see detail. So if I can make 16 black and I can still see 17, 18, 19, and uh, so on, that's where we want to be. So if I take the black level down, the factory position was 50. Now at 50, I can, mm, it's tough to see. 17 looks like it's like barely, barely, barely there. And I can see 18 fairly easily. I don't know if you can see 18 on the camera. Um, I can also see 19 very easily. And 20, 21, 22 become even easier. So I might just come up one click to 51. Wow, that's it. I go from 50 to 51. Now I can see 17, no problem. That's my darkest shadow in a movie. Um, you know, that's Batman's shoe in a dark scene. Uh, or, or maybe a, 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 a ghost hiding in the corner if you're watching something like The Conjuring or, or some scary movie like that. So one click up, not a big deal. If this room was like black, black, meaning I didn't have this window reflection back here, I've got three screens over here doing the webinar, um, I've got an exit light over here uh, above, the, above the door. Uh, if this room was pitch black, I might be able to see 17 on that factory setting of 50 but that's not the environment we're in. So we're gonna go up to 51, boom, now I can see 17. That's only one click, so I don't think it'll affect the contrast, but let's go back and just double check it. 
Uh, yes, and I can still see the same boxes I could see before. Great. So black level and white level are, are done. Super easy. Let's check the question box. Uh, Richard says, uh, can you switch the numeric text on the Meridio pattern generator? Uh, Richard, clear that up for me a little bit. When you say um, when you say switch the numeric text, just give me a little bit more of an idea there what you mean, and uh, I'll answer that as best as I can. Okay, now the next thing we need to do while we're on the dynamic range page is we need to take a quick reading uh, just to make sure our eyes match what, uh, what's actually going on here. So on this graph, uh, this is called a clip test. So we're gonna read um, the brighter levels 90 up to 108. Now these are in column percentages, call them IRE levels. Uh, so for example, 100% um, or 100 IRE in SDR is box 235. So what we wanna see here is we wanna see how well the white level tracks from 90% all the way up to 108. And 108 is gonna be up there in that like 254 neighborhood. What this test is gonna show us is if there's any clipping going on. Now our eyes told us there's not any clipping going on and it's probably right, but you know, you can't, in this whole world of calibration, you can't assume anything. You've gotta measure it and test. All right, let's do a read series and see how she goes. Wow, excellent. So um, one thing that stands out is the red and the green line is right on top of the yellow line, which is the target. The red and blue lines are above and below respectively. Uh, I have this backwards. Blue is higher and red is lower. At the end of this, these three lines, red, green, and blue, should be sandwiched together and following the yellow line. But we have not adjusted the white balance yet. And just based on looking at this, you know, it's gonna be, uh, it's gonna be too blue. Um, just to show you an example of bad, just so you can see it, I'm gonna crank the contrast up way too high intentionally, and then we'll run this test again. You guys can see how much damage it does. All right, let's go to the contrast. It's at 88, let's blast it. That's at max, and at max, let's see what the pattern looks like. Oh my gosh, no boxes. So when we run this test again, I would expect it to start clipping and doing some nasty stuff right away. So let's see, we should open up another tab so I don't lose track of what I'm doing. And boom, here we go, this will be fun. Bonk, clipped right there. So what does that mean? That means we're not gonna see any boxes at all above 100. Which is actually, I would expect it to clip a little bit earlier because we're also not seeing boxes below 235. But in either case, our eyes tell us it's clipped. The graph tells us it's clipped. That means it's clipped. So let's go back to the contrast setting and put it back at 88. There's only one TV I can think of in recent memory where the contrast was a lot higher than what we expect. Um, in most cases, I'm not going to say this for every TV, of course, but in most cases, the contrast goes to, let's say, 100. And at 100, almost every TV I've ever seen, ever, has, uh, has been clipped. But there's one TV, and it was very surprising to me, and I was very happy to find this. Um, the TCL 6 series, which I think, that was a few years ago, so maybe they're better one now. I think it's an 8 series. If you guys remember, just you know, feel free to chime in, let me know. We had major clipping errors with the contrast at 100, and as soon as I knocked it down one click to 99, I could see every single box. So the fact that I could leave the contrast that high without any distortion, it was pretty cool. In most cases, when the contrast goes to 100, we end up somewhere, 70 is a little low, but it is appropriate sometimes, but I usually end up 85 to 95, somewhere kind of right around in there. But again, this, these are just generalizations. Look at the test patterns, Trust your eyes, trust the graph, trust the meter. Uh, if your eyes and the meter agree, then you're definitely doing the right thing. Okay, cool. Now we're gonna look at the gamma. Now when we saw before, when Calman just took the two samples at the beginning, it was right at like 2.39, which is super close to our target of 2.4. But that was only two samples. I wanna see how the gamma is performing throughout the entire grayscale, and that's what this page is for. So instead of looking at two samples, we're gonna look at 10. 
So you'll notice 10 through 100 at the bottom, and then our gamma values are north and south. So the yellow line right now is at 2.4 because that's our target. If this were a brighter room, I might go for a 2.2 and my target would be a little bit lower. Um, so we're gonna go for 2.4, let's see how it tracks. So far so good, so far so good. Wow, so far really good. Guys, that is awesome. It's to be expected with a nicer TV like this. If we were to look at an entry level or even maybe a mid-level Sony, lots of great things about those TVs, especially for certain price points, but you don't get this kind of linearity and this kind of, I'm not gonna say perfection because it's not perfect, but it's very, very good. Um, but again, this is a nice TV, it's a high-end TV, not inexpensive at all, it's, it's meant to be a high-performance machine and it's tracking really, really well on the gamma. So I'm actually not gonna touch the gamma control at all. It's at minus two from the factory, and minus two in this mode gives us a 2.4. So I'm gonna leave it alone. Let's check the question box. Richard says, oh, white text indicating the various black levels will bias your ability to actually see the black level. Would be nice to be able to turn the white text off. Uh, also, okay, yeah, that's, you know, Richard, that's a good call, man. And um, I've seen other test patterns out there that don't have any text on the screen. Um, and as a calibrator, you just have to really understand that test pattern and know which boxes are which. But uh, yeah, I, I totally agree with you, man. In, in some environments, especially a pitch black environment, if there's white text on the screen, that could throw off your perception of the test pattern. Great, great call. Uh, Jared says, if you need to adjust the gamma, how would you do that? Good question. So uh, there is actually a gamma adjustment in the TV's menu. We'll take a look at it. I'll take a couple readings with some different values and we'll see exactly what happens. Now this is going to be under the brightness submenu. So let's go to the gamma control. There we go. It's at minus two right now. So let's crank it up to zero, which it probably is at zero in some uh, some of the other factory modes. So now it's in zero. Let's see what happens. We're going to open up another tab and then do a read series. It's still very, very linear, and it's right at 2.2. Again, if this room was a little brighter, I probably would use 2.2. Or if the room's dark and I'm sitting far away, I might still use 2.2. The fact that it's that linear is still very impressive. But what does this actually mean? If we're really lucky here, you guys will be able to see this on camera. Let's go to a grayscale test pattern. Okay, you guys can see that. Okay, um, I don't know if you guys are going to be able to see yeah, this first gray bar. It's actually the third bar. Depending on your monitor and your lighting environment right now, you may or may not see it. But there are two bars before that one. One that's like super black, one that's dark gray, and then you start to see the progression with the third bar up to white. So what does the gamma control actually do? Let's go back into the menu. And I'll crank it up and down, and you should be able to see it. Okay, let's find the gamma. Oops, I passed it. Okay, let's turn it up and see what happens. What should happen is the darker bars should get lighter, like a lighter gray or uh, or or just grayer in general. Uh, the middle of the grayscale will change a little bit. You might see that, you might not. The top end of the grayscale, the bright end of the grayscale is gonna change very, very, very little. And in most cases, you really can't see that change on the brightest bars, but you can see them very easily on the darkest bars. And that's just how our eyes work. It's a you know nonlinear type of thing. So let's crank it up, see what you guys can see. Okay, well on my monitor that I'm looking at right now at least, uh, when I turn the gamma up to max, um, those first few bars got a little bit grayer. If I come down and turn the gamma down all the way, uh, let's see, it goes minus two, which we were happy with, and then one more click down is minimum. Um, in, in this case, my eyes are telling me that the darkest bars got even a little bit darker. So if we measured the gamma at minimum, it's probably going to be something like 2.5 or 2.6. And there, you know, guys, there are instances where you might want to use a 2.5 or 2.6 
Um, I've seen that before, but what we're going to do for today is just leave it at minus two, and we're going to get a 2.4 curve. All right. Take a quick look here, see if you guys have any questions. Um, Jared says, if there, if it wasn't linear, are there controls to fine tune it? In most cases, Jared, yes. Um, and you can do this a couple of different ways. Some TVs will have a multi-point white balance system, and this one does, and we'll see that menu here in the next couple pages. Um, in those settings, for each level of the grayscale, you can adjust red, green, blue, and some TVs will also give you a luminance control for that level. So if your gamma curve, or in this case, the gamma line was kind of wavy or had some weird dips or weird spikes, you could fix just those levels that had weird dips or weird spikes, uh, totally, uh, as long as those controls actually work and do what they're supposed to do. Uh, a lot of other TVs don't have a luminance control in the white balance menu for each level, but you can manipulate the red, green, and blue adjustments to make that level brighter or darker. So for example, if I'm looking at like 50 IRE right in the middle and it's too dark, I can raise red, green, and blue the same amount of clicks at 50% and now 50% got a little bit brighter. So yes, you can fine tune the gamma if it's off. You're either gonna have a luminance control with your white balance controls for each level or you can use the white balance controls themselves to make certain levels brighter or darker. Now, this really only applies to TVs that have like a 10 point or a 20 point system. Uh, if you're just sticking with a two point system and the gamma's off, there's not a whole heck of a lot you can do. Um, so hopefully the TVs that you're working on or if, if you're calibrating your own TV uh, and the gamma is off, hopefully you have some of those more advanced controls in the white balance menu. Uh, when I started calibrating, a lot of TVs only had a single white balance adjustment. Um, it was really cool back in those days to find a TV that had a two point white balance adjustment. But in those early days, man, the TVs, some of them wouldn't even have a gamma control. So you would cross your fingers, do a one point white balance and just, you know, hope for the best. And, uh, you know, luckily those days are over and, and we have way, way, way better controls in, the, in these newer TVs. OK, so the gamma is looking really good at minus two. Um, now is the color decoder. So I tend to approach this uh, a couple of different ways. Um, in the early days of calibration, this was all we had for color adjustments. Uh, I didn't start seeing color management systems till about 2008 or nine, maybe. And even back in those early days of color management, the controls weren't very good and they didn't have the controls that we actually needed. Um, one TV that comes to mind just had a tint control for each color, which might have helped a little bit, but that's not everything that we need. So when we're adjusting the color and the tint, that's just like the overall color saturation and the overall tint uh, for the image. What you're supposed to do here, uh, any old school calibrators or somebody who they worked in broadcast before or with professional monitors before, some of those types of dis devices and displays will have what's called a blue only mode. So the key is to turn the blue only mode on and then adjust your color and your tint. Before blue only mode, some of us used to carry around these cardboard <laughs> sort of uh, almost 3D looking, you know, throwaway 3D looking kind of glasses made out of cardboard with some blue gels um, covering where your, where your eyes are. So uh, you would look through the blue glasses or you would turn on the blue only mode in the TV and then you would adjust color and tint. Um, we found over time that the blue glasses were not the right way to do it. Um, you would get one, you would come to one conclusion on a plasma and a completely different conclusion on a, an LCD TV, for example. Uh, and we learned pretty quickly to not trust the blue filters, the physical blue filters, all that well. Um, they're made in mass production. Um, one set of glasses, the blue filters might be a slightly different blue than another set of glasses that were made six months later. Um, if you, you know, if, if your glasses have been exposed to a lot of UV light, you know, they can kind of fade or, or shift in color. So we learned pretty quickly to not really trust those physical blue filters. Um, in, in a perfect world, the TV has a blue only mode and it works. Now here's the catch. This TV has color management and most other decent TVs and even, you know, mid-level TVs now and gosh, even some entry-level TVs have color management now. So you have to kind of ask yourself this question. When I'm adjusting the color gamut, if we use color and tint, those are number one, global controls, and number two, it's only two controls. So let's say there's a scenario where red is, let's say, way oversaturated and green is way undersaturated you can't fix both of those problems with one control. 
ideally you have a separate control for red and a separate control for green you can fix those individually and you're happy that is a proper color management system which this tv does have so what i tend to do on this page is check the menu if it has color management and it has all of the controls we need so i've got a control for the x value the y value and the luminance value i tend to skip this page but as i say that it's probably a good idea to at least look at something that you know just to make sure there aren't any weird anomalies or or just weird things um now there's a couple ways to do this there are the SIMD color bars, which we've been using for a very long time. Um, guys who've done this for a really long time, most of them can look at the SIMD bars and tell if things are oversaturated or undersaturated, or if the tint slash hue is off. Uh, that takes practice. It takes a lot of time looking at color bars and, and trying different adjustments. Um, if the color bars are still a little difficult for you, um, or if you want just like a second way of looking at this, there's a couple of test patterns that work out really well. Uh, one of them, shows five people with different skin tones. I like to call this the family portrait. Now, this test pattern with different skin tones and the primary and secondary colors are in their clothing. Um, I can look at this image and tell right away, oh my gosh, it's oversaturated or oh my gosh, it's undersaturated. Uh, and you see the same thing in the color bars, but you know, it just takes a little more practice with the color bars. So as I'm looking at the camera right now, this is one of those cases where <laughs> you can't trust the camera here, but as I'm looking at it with my eyes, the skin tones look pretty good. As I'm looking at it through the camera, what you guys are seeing, uh, they look way, way, way oversaturated. The gentleman in the upper left looks orange. Um, that's not what my eyes are seeing, so you kind of have to trust me on this. So uh, just for giggles, let's pop into this menu and let's just double check that this TV does have the controls that we want. Okay, so if we scroll down a little bit here, we've got a color menu and there's color and hue. So if we go to the color control, you can either go up or down, that's it. So if I crank it up, the saturation is gonna get worse. Now the people are really orange. If I crank it down, now everybody's gonna start to look pale. If I go to zero, we have a black and white image. Remember, color saturation is how much color's in the picture. If we turn it down to zero, there's no color in the picture, so you're left with black and white. So the middle position was right at 50. Now, this is an LED LCD, so I don't want to judge this off axis. You guys are going to see the back of my head for a second. I'm looking at it straight on axis now, and it actually looks pretty good. So I'm not going to touch the color control. Again, if there are any specific primary or secondary colors that are off, we'll know in the next few pages, and we can fix them from there. So let's leave this at 50 at the factor position, and then we're going to go to the hue slash tint control. There's only two ways I can go here. I can either go towards red or I can go towards green. You guys can see that in the lower right corner. It's at the factory position, which is zero, and things look pretty good. If the skin tones looked overly pink or overly green, that's almost always gonna be a hue or a tint problem. So let's go towards green. And everybody turns yellow and then eventually green. No good. Our, and by the way, guys, our eyes are most sensitive to green out of all the colors. So if you leave things green, everybody's going to notice. If we go down towards red, you'll see everybody turn like a rosy pink, right? So both examples of bad and both extremes, of course, I went all the way up and all the way down. But at zero from the factory, nobody looks pink, nobody looks green. I'm going to leave those at their factory positions and we're going to move on. And just remember, if the TV doesn't have color management, you only have your color and tint controls to work with. So it might be an either or type situation. Rarely is it both. Okay, next page is resolution. We're gonna check out the aspect ratio, make sure that's all lined up. And then we're gonna check the sharpness, make sure there's no extra distortions or extra edge enhancement. So there's a handful of test patterns that work really well right here, um, which is why Calman kind of gives you three examples. Um, we're gonna stick with a test pattern that I really enjoy. It's the ISF geometry pattern. The reason I like this test pattern is because in one test pattern, I can see many different things. So there's the geometry pattern. So the first thing we can look for is the aspect ratio or how well is the picture fitting the screen. Um, you know, this is a, a 3840 by 2160, 16 by nine screen. 
the test pattern. Uh, this particular test pattern is 1080p, but it is 16 by 9. So we should see the entire test pattern on the screen. Now, what am I actually looking for here? You'll see that this test pattern, the white lines make this big diamond shape. So at the very top, up here, the very bottom, all the way down, all the way to the left, and all the way to the right, I can see the tips of the diamond. That's a good sign. That usually means that the bitmapping is correct. Bitmapping meaning that the content is lining up with the screen, okay? Now, just to see what can happen here, let's go into the aspect ratio settings. And that's gonna be under the screen submenu. And right now the wide mode is in auto. Auto display area is turned on. So let's see what other options are here. We've got auto, wide zoom, normal, full, another zoom mode, and that's it. If we leave it in auto, it should do what it's supposed to do. If we leave it in full, that looks like it's mapping correctly also. Let's see what else is in here. There's a couple of other options. Auto display area. Automatically adjust the viewable screen area based on the signal. This auto thing should work. If I turn it off, let's see if there's any changes. No, there's not. Okay, now when I turn that off, there was something else that popped up too. This is really what you're looking for. Of course, every manufacturer calls it something different. But in Sony language, they have the display area labeled as full pixel. And what they mean by that is the pixels of the test pattern or the content and the pixels of the TV line up correctly. I'll see if you guys can see my hands right here. So if the bit mapping is off, you have the content and then you have the TV. So things aren't lining up correctly. As soon as you put it in full pixel mode, everything lines up correctly. Now you can set your sharpness. Imagine how difficult it would be to set the sharpness if the, if the pixels aren't lined up. So it's always a good idea to get the aspect ratio taken care of first and then go ahead and adjust the sharpness. Hopefully that makes sense. So we're gonna leave the wide mode in full. We're gonna leave the display area in full pixel. Now we can adjust the sharpness. Funny thing about sharpness, you'd think that more is better, right? I want a sharper picture, so let's crank up the sharpness. And that could not be further from the truth. And it's very deceiving and very confusing. In most cases, I'm not gonna say this for every TV. In most cases, you end up with the sharpness usually all the way down. But there are some TVs out there where if you turn the sharpness down to zero, it does make the picture look blurry. Maybe the factory position's at 50 and that's correct. Just depends on the manufacturer, they're all different. Let's go into the picture menu and let's find the sharpness control. It should be under the clarity submenu and boom, there it is. So the sharpness control is at 50, dead center factory position. If I turn it up, I can see some distortions. If I turn it down, some of the distortions go away. So I really want you guys to see this like kind of up close and personal. So bear with me just a second. I'm gonna take my new little awesome camera here and I'm gonna zoom in as much as I can at least to some of these lines on the test pattern. Oof, that's all I can go. You guys might see this, but that's the closest I can get with the, with the zoom on this camera. So again, sharpness is at 50 from the factory. What I'm looking for here, I like to call these like ruler marks or hash marks. Um, and we've got them, you know, from the left side of the screen, the first one is zero. The last one is 1920. At the top, the first one is zero. At the very bottom is 1080. So we have every single pixel, uh, if you will, represented here. I can see them all. That's great. But what I want to look for here in these little hash marks or ruler marks, I want to make sure that they don't have any extra edge enhancement. So what I mean by that is the background of the of the of this part of the pattern is gray and the little ruler marks are black. So it's a black line on top of a gray background and there should not be anything else there. And you may see, I hope you do, when you turn the sharpness up, especially to the extremes, you start to see these white halos or white distortions or what it really is is edge enhancement. So around some of these numbers, like around 1300, for example, around the one, I see like, it's almost like the, the black number one is on top of a white background, which is then on top of a gray background. That white is not supposed to be there. It's also making curved numbers like the three 
and the zeros in 1300, we're starting to see some like jagged, almost stair stepping going around those curved uh, numbers. So you can only imagine how bad this can be if you're watching TV. And you know, think of a, a good example like um, that really cool scene. It's either in Blue Planet or one of the plan one of the Planet Earth uh, uh, documentaries. But if you guys have seen this, it, it's a really cool scene. I don't remember where it was shot at, but this iguana is like running through. Maybe they're at a beach or something, but this iguana is running through a big, uh, a big area that's full of like rocks and 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 a bunch of just a bunch of little different colored gray and white. And so he's running across these rocks, and there's snakes everywhere, and the snakes are trying to get the iguana. Uh, if you haven't seen that scene before, I, I apologize for not remembering which one it's in, but I'm sure if you Google it, you can find it real quick. Um, and then after the scene is over, and, and oh, this is going to be a spoiler alert, sorry, um, the, the iguana makes it, none of the snakes get him, and after he gets away from the snakes, they do this really, really zoomed in close up of his face. So we're looking at a bunch of fine detail in the rocks, we're looking at a bunch of fine detail in the snakes and their scales and their skin, and then when the iguana comes up at the very end, zoomed in, there's a just immense amount of detail in his scales and in his eyes and, and and everything. So if I'm looking at this really super fine detail stuff and I crank the sharpness up too high, all that stuff that's supposed to look smooth and natural and, and soft now looks super distorted and I can barely make out what's going on. Another good example of this is the opening scene in The Dark Knight when the two bank robbers, uh, bank robbers zip line uh, from, the, from the big glass building to the roof of the next building watch that scene with all the rocks and pebbles that they land on on the roof and crank the sharpness up and see see what happens to those round rocks it's really really gross the other thing i like to call out here too is text you know it, it, there's a lot of people out there who watch sports and the news and there's a lot of text on the screen so you run into that same problem that we're running into here where the curves and the numbers themselves um, are super jagged and just gross looking so the goal here is to get the picture as you know, kind of sharp and as clear as you possibly can without any distortions. And like I mentioned before, in most of these cases, to achieve that, you have to turn the sharpness down to zero. So let's see what happens here. I don't think you guys will see this, so you have to trust me. I turn the sharpness down to zero, and right, actually right around 20, from, mm, I should say 15. Yeah, right around 15 and down to zero, it looks about the same to me. But between 15 and especially at zero, I now have a black background and white lines and, I'm sorry, black lines and black text on the screen. So it might sound counterintuitive to turn the sharpness down to zero. Um, in, in very rare cases in the calibration universe, you turn something all the way up or all the way down, but you might have something like a backlight that you have to turn all the way up. You might have something like sharpness that you have to turn all the way down. So um, kind of a long rant on a very simple adjustment. But I just want to make sure you guys sort of uh, understand what's going on with the test pattern and what to look for and what could potentially go wrong. All right, cool. Let's keep moving along here. Next, we're going to go to the grayscale, a.k.a. white balance. And guys, I just checked the time, too. Um, uh, if you guys need to go, I know we're a, a bit over now. We still have to look at HDR. I am recording this, and it's going to go up on YouTube. So if you guys have to bail out, I totally understand. Uh, no problem there at all, and we're gonna we'll tweet out and we'll send out the uh, the uh, YouTube link once it's all done. Okay, so this TV does have. Let's just double check it. This TV has a few different options for white balance. We're gonna go into the color submenu. Then we look at color temperature. We have expert one, expert two. Also warm one, I'm sorry, warm, and then neutral, and then cool. I think you guys can see this on camera, but when I flip from one of the expert modes up to warm, it gets a little bluer. I can see it with my eyes. You probably can see it in the camera. It was a subtle change, but it did go blue. We go up to neutral, it gets even bluer. We go up to cool, it gets really, really blue. That should be very obvious to you. But expert one and expert two, those are the ones that we want to adjust. Those are the ones that give us the settings. There might be some settings in warm as well, but if expert one or expert two are already closer, I'm just gonna go ahead and use those anyway. So let's leave it in expert one. 
Now, if we scroll down, there was a uh, like an advanced menu, advanced color adjustment down here in the bottom right. It's the very last sub menu in the menu system. We're going to open that up. First option here is advanced color temperature basic. <laughs> it's advanced, but it's basic, I, I guess. And there's six controls here: red, green, blue gain, and red, green, blue bias. What does that mean? When you see red, green, blue gain, those are the adjustments for the brighter end of the grayscale. If you see red, green, blue bias, those are the adjustments for the dark end of the grayscale. Now, Sony's used this language for a long time. Other manufacturers do too, but the, the, the names of these things is not really standardized. In fact, gain and bias, uh, I think Thomas was saying earlier, he, he had an old Sony CRT. Uh, that language really comes from back in those days. Uh, but you might see high and low, you might see uh, gain and offset, you know, there's a, a few different things there that, that you might run into. Here's the point of me telling you this, you might not know. So how do you know? How do you figure this out? It's actually pretty simple. I used to do this all the time with older TVs that were very uh, inconspicuous with their, with their settings and their controls. So pretty easy to do. I pull up the grayscale pattern. And let's say this just, this just said red, green, blue, red, green, blue. No gain, no bias. So I got to figure out which control does what. So I mentioned before, if you've calibrated for a while and you've started studying color science a, a bit, um, we're most sensitive to green. Human eyes are most sensitive to green. So how can we test this? If I go to the green gain control, it's already maxed out. That's how Sony does it. So we're going to press enter. I can't go any higher, but I can go lower. So if you look at a CIE chart, what's opposite of green? It's magenta, okay? So if I turn down the green, I would expect some part of this grayscale to start to look magenta. So let's see. And boom, right away, wow, okay. So it was like a few clicks. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, right about five, minus five, minus six. I can start to see it look magenta. Now, if we go real far down so you guys can kind of see the extremes, the bright end of the grayscale, oh, this is tough to see in the camera, but the bright end of the grayscale is way more magenta looking than the dark end of the grayscale. So that doesn't tell me the whole story, but it gives me a clue that the gain control is probably the bright control or the high end control for the grayscale. We'll do the same thing on the low end. The bias control for green, red, and blue in Sony is set to zero or the middle position from the factory. So here you can go up or down. So if we go to the green control and I crank it up, which part of the grayscale turns green? It's the dark end. I just maxed it out. The dark end looks a little green. The bright end looks slightly green. So again, these are just clues to help you figure out like what exactly does what. So just to give you a little bit of a quick tip there, on Sony's though, we know that the gain is the bright side, we know that the, the bias is the dark side. Okay, so this is a two point system. Actually, <laughs> Sony actually tells you right here, adjust green in the dark scenes. Okay, cool. Let's go back a page and then let's see what else we have in here for white balance controls. always do that. I always go to that wrong sub menu. Okay. Advanced color adjustment. Now remember there was a basic advanced color adjustment basic control. We've got red, green, and blue, gain and offset or gain and bias. Okay, that's the two point. Excellent. What else do we have here? This TV should have at least a 10 point. For those of you who might be new to this, I like to use an audio analogy for this. So you can think of it like the two point adjustment is like a stereo with a bass control and a treble control. You can adjust the bottom end, you can adjust the top end. That's bass and treble, right? But what if you have problems in the middle, in the mid range? If you only have a bass and treble control, it's gonna be really tough to fix the mid range, right? So now, how do you fix the mid-range? You throw in an equalizer. With an equalizer, you can adjust specific frequencies without messing with the other frequencies. It's a little more technical than that, but you get the general idea. 
So if I have a two point control and it works, great. But if it doesn't work and I do need to do some more fine tuning, that's when we'll crack open the 10 point system and, and dial the death out of it if we need to. So underneath basic, we have advanced color temperature multi-point and uh, it looks like it is a 10 point system. So the first option here is the adjustment point and we can go from one all the way up to 10. So one is 10% or 10 IRE, which is gonna be just above black, that's the darker setting, or the darker part, I should say. Two is 20, three is 30, four is 40, et cetera, et cetera. And then the 10 control is 100% white. So instead of just having two knobs for the white balance, I have 10 knobs. If I need to fine tune it, I certainly can, which is cool. I don't know if I'll need to though, because these Sonys do dial in really, really well. So now the next question is, if I have a, a darker control and a brighter control, where do we start? And it might seem logical to do like 10 and 100 because those are the extremes, but we find that the, that doesn't always work the best. We like to find averages. So if you split the grayscale in half, the dark part is zero to 50, the bright part is 50 to 100. If you split those in half, the dark side is about 25, the bright side is something like 75. We can set the generator to like 80 and 30, and that should be kind of an average enough to flatten out the entire grayscale. It's just a prediction, it's just a guess, but it does work most of the time. Uh, there are other TVs out there, plenty of them that I've run into in the past, where 80 and 30 did not work well as the anchor points. Maybe 60 and 40 worked a little bit better. Maybe 80 and 20 looked a little bit better. Regardless of any of that, start with 80 and 30, check the grayscale. If it still has problems, you can try two different points. If it still has problems from there, it's probably time to start looking at the 10 or the 20 point system. So um, I tend to adjust the bright end first, just because that might, or in some cases, usually affects the dark end, whereas it's the opposite for the low controls. The low controls typically stay down in the lower uh, parts of the grayscale. So we're gonna start with the gain controls and I'm gonna use 80% as the anchor point or reference point, if you will. So I've got 80 chosen in Caliban. Now we just have to start the meter. So I'm gonna do a continuous read here so I can see it in real time. And if you look at the RGB balance graph in the upper right corner of Caliban, it's telling us that there's not enough red and there's too much blue. Good, easy fix. So on the gain controls in the Sony, you can't turn red, green, or blue up anymore. They're already at max. So the only thing I can do here, at least to start, is to lower blue. So we're gonna go here, start lowering blue, and then eventually it should line right up with that green bar. Boom, there we go. Now notice red's a little low still. You can't add more red. So what do you do? If you can't add red, take away the other two. So let's lower green a little bit. And we really want these red, green, and blue bars to flatten out best as they can. Red and green look pretty good. Let's go back to blue. Let's lower that a little bit more. And wow, pretty close. Okay, so I'm looking at the, um, I'm looking at the RGB balance graph in the upper right corner, and I've got really, really close bars here. Underneath that is a CIE chart zoomed in really far to the white point, and it looks like the target is basically right there. Um, when I'm this close, I like to look at the numbers. Um, the, the worst thing you can do with the grayscale is leave it too green. So I wanna really, really, really be sure that it's not too green. How do I know? I look at the numbers. So remember, the, uh, the, the coordinates for D65, AKA reference white is, 0.313 on the x-axis, so going left and right, and 0.329 on the y-axis, which goes north and south. So once I get the RGB balance fairly leveled out, the dot is basically in the target, I still like to look at the numbers just to make sure there's not any extra green in there. So if we look at the numbers now, it's 0 0.312, 0 0.327. It's not a bullseye, but don't forget that there are tolerances here that are acceptable. And at 312327, we are within an acceptable tolerance. It looks like a question just came in. Let's check that. Uh, Jared says, should you adjust to get the best delta error, even if that means 
higher adjustments? Um, good question. We don't calibrate to delta errors. And the reason we don't calibrate to delta errors is because of what I just said before. If I'm reading 313, so it's perfect on X, 331, which is not perfect on Y, if the target's 329 and the measurement is 333, that means the dot is higher or more north than the reference white point. And if you look at the CIE chart, if the dot for white is too high, now you're going towards green. But because the coordinates are still very close, you might still have a really low, low delta error. So if you calibrate to delta errors and you still leave the grayscale green, that's the worst thing you can do. So we always, always, always get it in the ballpark, perhaps, with the delta error, but what really matters at the end of the day are those coordinates. So 313329 is the target, 312327 is where we're at right now. That's perfectly acceptable within tolerance, okay? Now that's the bright side. Let's go down to the dark side, and we're gonna pick level 30, and we're gonna do the same exact thing, but now with the bias controls. So we're gonna go down to red, green, blue bias. Let's start the meter. Oh, wow, look at that. Um, Huh. Yeah. 312, 328. Well within tolerance, just like we were at the at the bright end. This is a good sign. I'm surprised slash not surprised to see this. And the reason I say that is because we only adjusted the gains, and that took care of the low end, at least at 30, right? But I have seen this in a lot of the, the newer, nicer Sony's. They give you a two-point control, but just by ju only by adjusting the bright controls, it tends to level out the entire grayscale. So for the low-end controls, as of right now, I'm not going to touch them. Now, here's the issue. We're only looking at 80 and 30. I have no knowledge of how the rest of the grayscale looks, but I know 80 and 30 are good. So let's stop the meter. We're going to go to the next page, which is the multi-point grayscale adjustment. Now down here, we have levels and in increments of five from zero all the way up to 100. Now if I wanna see that much detail, I certainly can. But the TV only has a 10 point adjustment. So seeing all the fives in between, it might be cool to see them, but it's not like you can fix them. So if I'm using a 20 point system in a TV that has 20 point controls, then yes, I'll leave this zero to 20 in increments of five. No big deal, right? But we're not dealing with that. We're dealing with uh, a 10 point system. So if we go into the Calman settings on the workflow basic options, which is the first tab, go down about a third, we have grayscale points and it's set to 20, five through 100. Take the drop down screen, tons of different options. So we're gonna look for the 10 point. Here's a 10 point, 10 to 100. Underneath that, there's a 11 point which also reads zero, zero being the 11th point. It's not 100% necessary to read zero, but I do like to at least know what's going on down there. Um, because depending on the white balance controls, there might be some green at zero. And I wanna see that if that's the case. So just to be safe, and, and that might not be the case, but I still wanna know. Again, you can't assume anything in this universe because uh, you'll, it'll end up burning you in the end. Trust me, I've learned that over the years, especially at the beginning. So we're gonna pick the 11 point, and now we're zero through 100. Let's do a read series, and let me make sure the menu's off the screen, just in case. By the way, too, guys, I do tend to notice on the Sonys that having the menu on the screen doesn't really do a whole lot. Uh, I can't say the same for other TVs, so maybe just out of habit, I do like to uh, make sure the menu's off the screen. Looks like there's a question. Let me hit the read series button and check the question. Read series, and boom, and let's check the question. Jared says, could you further adjust to 329 if you could? Uh, Jared, yes, it depends on the, the granularity of the control. Uh, if I'm at 328 and I add a click of green and it jumps up to 333, uh, the control is too sensitive. I can't, I can't do it. Uh, you can also do some other things like play around with blue a little bit to see if that gets you right on target to 329. But here's the good news. 325 to 329 is the, the, the window of tolerance. 
So if 329 is the target and you're at 328, 327, 326, 325, you're still within tolerance. But if you go 329, 330, 331, 332, 333, most people can see green at 330. I didn't believe it at first. When I first started doing this, I pulled up, um, I was in a completely pitch black room. I pulled up some test patterns and I would add like one click of green thinking I'm never going to see this and absolutely we could see it. And the, 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 the measurement was coming in at like 331. And don't forget too, the, the, the meter itself has a little bit of a tolerance too. So even just like a smidge of extra green, you'll see it. But a smidge of extra blue, most people don't see it. A smidge of extra red, most people don't see it either. Our eyes are sensitive to green first, then red, and then blue. So if you can't hit the targets perfect and you can't get them with intolerance, would you rather err towards red, green, or blue? I will say blue 100% of the time. Cool, hopefully that answers that question. All right, now we just, wow, we just did a read series and I'm looking at the RGB balance graph and it is flat as a board. Super impressive, hats off to Sony, you know, golf clap if you will. So I get excellent, excellent results here. Remember, the RGB balance graph doesn't tell you the whole story. We still have to look for coordinates, okay? So the coordinates are gonna be down here. Now we started at zero, and zero was 0 .007 nits. This is an awesome TV with a backlit LED system. That's very, very dark, so that's okay, that's good. I read it, didn't end up needing to do anything, but that's okay, at least we know. So on the Y axis here, the lowercase y, at 10 through 100, if 329 is the target and 330 gets us into trouble, I like to just scan with my eyes across all of these lowercase y numbers and make sure that none of them are 330 or greater. So as I'm looking at the y values, I've got a 326, which is still within tolerance, 327, 328, 328, 328, 328, 328, 327, 328, 329. Excellent. I don't need to do anything to the y axis on any points of the grayscale. Now let's look at the X coordinate. Remember the target's 313, but you do have some tolerance. 312, 311, 312, 312, 313, 312, 312, 312, 313, 313, I'm about to say 313 and then 313 on 100. Guys, this is really cool. And you're not gonna see this on a lot of other TVs. The only thing we did today was adjust the bright end of the grayscale and we now have a perfect grayscale. Super, super cool to see this kind of stuff. If, if you had shown me this five years ago, four years ago, and said, this is a consumer TV that anyone can buy from any retailer, I would have said, you're crazy. That's a professional monitor. Stop trolling me. But we're starting to see this stuff these days. I'd say in the last two years or so, to be honest, maybe even three years. So the fact that we're getting this level of performance on a consumer TV, is really, really cool. Um, just to take a look at the Delta Airs, because I know some people are interested in that. Um, we've got a 0 0.5 Delta Air at 100, uh, 0.8 at 80, and everything else is just super, super low. So if our biggest Delta Air in the grayscale is a 0.8, super impressive. We want to be under 3.0, the lower the better, of course, but once you start getting numbers under 1.0, that's when you're starting to talk about professional monitors that are $1,000 an inch. So this is a 65 inch TV that I think you can buy for about three to $4,000 and the grayscale is near perfect. I love it, that's super cool, let's move on. Looks like there might be a question. Richard says, uh, oh, Jared says, is the luminance something to adjust the Y value? Sort of what I was talking about before, Jared, if the, if the multi-point white balance does give you a luminance control for each level, yeah, you could adjust it there. If not, then you could probably use the RGB controls for each level. Add five clicks of red, green, blue. Now that level is a little bit brighter. Or the opposite end, you take away five clicks of red, green, and blue. And now that level is a little bit darker. So there are ways to manipulate that stuff if you don't have a luminance control for each level. Uh, Richard says, also be mindful that our perception of Delta ITP is good rather than Delta E2000. Um, Jared, or was that Richard or Jared? Okay, that was Jared. Um, Good point. Uh, there are some more accurate uh, delta error formulas now based on more or less how our eyes see. 
And if you want to measure these levels in ITP delta formula, you can certainly do that. That's not a problem. Uh, you can, you can. There's many different delta formulas out there. ITP being kind of the newest, latest, greatest. Um, I've seen that. Again, I'm not going to say all TVs, but I've seen in a lot of cases you almost have to use ITP for HDR. Um, in a lot of cases, too, 2000 might still work okay for SDR. But point of the story is, is that you can you can use whatever delta formula you want. Um, Richard says, also be mindful that our perception to any color is directly influenced by the neighboring color. Thank you for saying that. I ran into a situation one time. Um, this has happened a couple times, but this was sort of an extreme. So I want to tell the story. Um, I had a client reach out to me who lived way down in South Florida, like four hours one way for me. And he's like, hey, man, I've got this JVC projector and my whole entire system is DIY and I did all this studying. It took me like three years to build the system. And you know, the guy was a doctor and probably had some other smart friends. And, you know, the room was the, the equipment list was impressive. The, the way he was describing the room, it was a dedicated room with no windows and he had acoustic treatments and it sounded really nice. So I get down to his house again, four hours, one way. I walk into the room. The first thing I notice is that the ceiling is white. The carpet is this beigey color and the walls are yellow. So I'm thinking to myself, man, this and the installation was great, by the way. He didn't overdo it on the screen size. He had a nice projector, you know, all those things. And it like broke my heart that the walls were yellow. Richard's exactly right. Our perception of white or gray or any color for that matter can be affected by the environment that you're in. Or if you're looking at multiple colors, like maybe the Simpty bars, and you're really concentrating on yellow, for example, the colors around it may influence your perception. So this is why I always, always, always tell people when you're doing a dedicated room or you're in some type of studio, like the studio that I record our training videos and stuff in, next room over here, purposefully, we painted that room, excuse me, we painted that room in neutral gray. When I'm shooting in there, I want the camera and the colors and everything to look correct. I'm using D65 lighting to light up uh, my table and myself when I'm doing these trainings and stuff. And I didn't want any of that stuff to look off. So, you know, when you're watching something like hockey or planet Earth and it's the Antarctica scene and there's lots of white on the screen, that white light is bouncing off the screen onto the yellow wall, back onto the screen and then into your eyes. No good because now everything looks yellow. Thank you, Richard, for calling that out. Very, very good point. Okay, what's next? Next is the color management. We know the grayscale is good. Awesome, it's actually very, very good. We don't know the state of the primary and secondary colors. So let's take a reading first, and then we'll know what to fix. I always say this, you can't fix what you don't measure. Let's do a quick read series. The white point is bang on, very good. All right. Red is a little oversaturated, so is yellow, so is green, cyan is really close, blue is really close, magenta is a tad oversaturated and a little blue, okay? Now remember guys, this is a two-dimensional chart not showing us that third dimension of how bright each color is. That's what the gamut luminance graph is for. So. The gamut luminance graph can be a little deceiving because it looks like right now that red, blue, magenta are like way too dark, whereas green, cyan, and yellow are a lot closer. But here's the catch. Look at the scaling of the graph. It goes from one to minus one. So we are super zoomed into the graph right now. If we zoom out of the graph, the errors won't look as bad as they look right now. Right click on the graph, click properties, change the axis property to auto. Now look, now we're going 20 to minus 20. Now the errors don't look so bad. I would wanna to touch up red for sure, it's a little dark still. Same with blue, same with magenta. Even if we zoom back in and look at the other colors, you know, green's still real close. So is cyan, so is yellow, okay? So how do we know if it's close enough? Now we can start looking at things like delta errors, again, just to get us into the ballpark. So red, or I'm sorry, blue seems to be the worst error. It's a little off on X and Y and it's way off on luminance. So let's look at blue. 
if we use the numbers down here, the hard data, the good stuff, and we look at blue, the target for blue is 0.153. I'm sorry, these are the readings. 0 0.153, 0 0.052 with a luminance of 4.6. Those are the readings. The targets are 0 0.150, 0 0.060, and 5.15. So if I'm at 4.6 and the target is 5.1, blue's too dark. So we can see it in the graph. We can see it in the numbers. Blue needs to be addressed. Now it's not that bad because the overall delta error, and of course this number would change based on the, uh, the formula you're using, but at least in delta error 2000 right now, the overall delta error, considering how bad it might look, is still only a 2.79. And that's still under three, which is the ultimate goal. But I know this TV can do better, and I'm a nerd, so I'm gonna try to get it a little bit closer. Red, pretty good. Even though it's a little dark on luminance, it's still under one on the delta error. If you look at magenta, even though it's a little too dark and a little too blue, we're still at a 1.8 on the delta error. So guys, these are very, very good numbers considering we haven't touched anything yet in the color management. But again, I want you guys to see the controls and I want to nerd out and see, see how accurate this TV can be. It doesn't matter necessarily which order you do the, the, the each color in, uh, but I do like to kind of stick to this rule of thumb. The secondary colors are products of the primary colors. So if you do the primary colors first, the secondary colors are, there's a good chance that they might land where they're supposed to land anyway. So, you know, a little bit less work for you. Now, if you're going to do the uh, primary colors first, totally fine. Doesn't matter what order you do them in. But I do like to sort of think about, like, which one has the biggest error. That's the one I want to concentrate on the most. Um, I don't know if you guys just experienced this, but my audio just did something real weird. If you guys can't hear me or something weird happened with the audio, please let me know. Uh, for some reason, my right channel, my headphones just completely died. Okay, uh, so let's start with blue. That seems to be the worst error right here at like a 2.7. The biggest problem with blue is that it's too dark. The X and Y is actually pretty close. Uh, let's see, is somebody giving me some? Okay, audio is good. Thank you, guys. Thank you, thank you. Okay, um, since blue is too dark, that's where we're going to start. Now, something to remember about the primary and secondary colors. Number one, luminance is most important on the primary colors. So that's what you want to address first. Once you get the luminance under control, that's when you can start really dialing in the hue and the saturation for that color, AKA the, uh, the X and Y coordinate. So we're gonna start with blue and we're gonna start with luminance. I've got the meter up there now. Let's start the meter. And let's find that blue control. Gonna be in the color menu. Oh no, sorry, it's gonna be in the advanced. Ah, it's gonna be the in the advanced color menu. And of course I hit exit instead of back. Oops, picture. And then we'll go all the way down to advanced color adjustment. Okay, here's what we're looking for. Number one, there's a sub menu called per color adjustment. Excellent. That's where we want to be. Now in in the per color adjustment sub menu, adjustment color, we have red. Magenta, blue, cyan, green, yellow. Sweet, all six colors. Underneath each color is hue, saturation, and lightness, which is luminance. Excellent. This is a proper three-dimensional color management system. So remember, guys, we were talking earlier about adjusting the kind of generic global color and tint controls. What would you rather have if you're fine-tuning something? two controls or 18 controls i'm taking the 18 controls all day every day so with the hue adjustment the saturation adjustment and the luminance adjustment all three dimensions are covered and because of the adjustment color all six colors are represented so we should be able to really really dial this in okay we're going to start with blue make sure to pick blue in the sub menu and what's the biggest problem with blue it's too dark so we're going to take the lightness control, raise it, and in the gamut luminance graph in Calman, what's cool about this is the, the graph will scale based on the size of the error. 
So as the error gets smaller, the graph will get uh, smaller as well. So as I turn up the lightness for blue, you'll see the blue bar creep up to zero, and right about there, it's perfect. So I had to go up six clicks in blue luminance. Now blue luminance is perfect. Now with that being fixed, let's look at the overall delta error. It's still a 2.9. Well, wait a second. We started with 2.9 and we fixed the luminance. Why is it still a 2.9? Take a look at the blue dot. This might be hard to see. It's even hard for me to see and I'm, I'm inches from the screen. The blue dot is south of the target which means we need to probably adjust the saturation a little bit, maybe the hue a little bit. Now, here's, what's, here's one of the great things about this page. There's three graphs up here that tell you the delta error for luminance, chrominance, which is also saturation, and H for hue. So delta L, delta C, delta H. This tells you what's wrong with that color. So right now, we've got the gamut luminance zeroed out, so there's no luminance error. Excellent. The dot's not in the hole, so we have a saturation error, and we also have a hue error. So how do we fix the saturation error with the saturation control for blue? So we'll start the meter. It's hard for me to see on the graph, so I'm just gonna sort of guess here on which way to turn the saturation. If I turn it one way and the error gets bigger, I'm going the wrong way. So let's just go down first. And look at that, the delta C number's dropping, 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 boom. Now look at what that did to the luminance. The luminance got real bright. So this is gonna be a balancing act between the two. Let's adjust the hue just a little bit while we're here. Watch that delta H graph. If I go to the right, the air is getting worse, which means I need to go to the left. If I could see the dot a little bit better, it would be easier just to visualize it, but I'm just gonna go by the delta graphs for now. Okay, delta H is perfect. Look at what that did to the saturation and the lightness, aka luminance. So we might have a little bit of a tough time here with blue. Let's see. Let's add a little bit more saturation in so the delta C number gets better. And let's maybe darken it a little bit. And let's see if we can take care of that pesky luminance error. Remember guys, the luminance error is the most important one here because blue is a primary color. So if you can get the luminance right and maybe the saturation's a little off, that's a good trade. Ideally, everything's perfect, but we're not in a perfect world. All right, we're getting close now. So the luminance error is gone, the saturation error is very, very small, and the hue error is very small, which gives us an overall delta error of 1.4. That's awesome. We cut the delta error in half in about two minutes or so. Really good. Now, for the sake of time, I do want to move on, but if we fiddled with this a little bit more, I bet you we could get it to, to, to basically perfect and get those delta errors super low, but we'll leave it here for now just to save some time. It looks like there's a question. Let's check that out. Uh, Jared says, are there controls in the TV uh, to adjust the TV settings in Calman versus using the remote? Uh, Jared, yes, in some cases, some TVs can talk directly to Calman. Uh, if we were doing the auto cal workflow, you would see some of that type of stuff right there. Uh, Greg says, can you change the target to 75? Absolutely. This is actually a really good tip. Um, there's a lot of cases out there where some TVs, and this really happens a lot with projectors too, especially if the screen's too big, where it just cannot hit 100% saturated red, green, blue, cyan, magenta, yellow, whatever. So what Greg is suggesting is using 75% saturation instead of 100. And we can certainly do that. And I do do this in the real world sometimes. If I'm running into one of those situations where uh, I can't hit 100% fully saturated for whatever color it is. The other thing this might help too is we'll look at another graph a little bit later called saturation sweeps which shows you how well that color tracks from no color, so white, all the way out to 100% saturation. And there's multiple targets in between the two, or yeah, in between the two. So uh, if you're at 100% saturation and the TV can't hit it, then you know crank down your target to 75%. Um, if you have a really bad saturation sweep, try recalibrating that color at 75% instead and you might get a better saturation sweep. So um, let's take a look at that just so we can, uh, just so we can bring up Greg's, what Greg was saying. Uh, we're gonna go, oops. We're gonna go here into the settings and we're at the color gamut page and stimulus level 75 and, sorry, my second screen here is a little tiny inch, six inch monitor. Uh, am, I, am I missing it? 
it's in here somewhere. Greg, if you remember exactly where it's at, let me know because I'm having a hard time seeing it. Uh, luminous levels, color gamut, stimulus level. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Is it in? Okay, I, that's okay. Um, but you guys get the point. You know, if if you're having um, if you're if you're having issues with saturation sweeps, or if you're having issues with a projector or a TV like this hitting 100%, absolutely crank down your uh, your test pattern so it's 75% saturation. So your target would actually end up being like here somewhere instead of all the way out to 100%. But awesome, good point. Uh, let's see if there's anything else. Uh, Thomas says the new Sony's can connect to Calman. Sony does have a proprietary software package for their projectors. Um, I have not yet seen any of them talk directly to Calman, but the flat panel TVs, as long as it's a master series, will. Yep, Thomas says flat panels. Yes, as long as it's a master series, absolutely. Okay, let's see if there's any other questions, and no. Okay, great. So blue's looking pretty good. What's the next worst color? I would say red. So let's bring up red, start the meter. What's wrong with red? Well, it's a little dark, and it's a little oversaturated. I know it's oversaturated because there's a chrominance error and also the dots outside of the box. So oversaturated here, oversaturated here, red's oversaturated. So let's adjust the luminance first. Go back a menu. And we're gonna go into the advanced color temperature again. Advanced color adjustment, I should say. Per color adjustment. And now we're going to change this over to red. There's red. Okay. Now let's adjust the luminance problem first. Red's a little dark. Should be at zero. The bar's lower than zero. So let's raise that luminance control and oop, a little too much. And boom goes the dynamite. So red luminance, no problem, fixed. Let's fix the saturation. Hopefully that doesn't screw up the luminance, but we don't know yet. Let's see. So red's a little oversaturated, so I'm going to lower that control. Hopefully the red dot moves over right into the box, and hopefully that delta C number drops down to zero. Getting close, getting close, getting close, and boom goes the dynamite. So we've got a very low luminance error, a very low saturation error. The hue is still off just a teeny tiny bit. So let's see if we can maybe uh, get that just a little bit tighter. And boom, there it is. Maybe the saturation, one more click, oops, wrong direction. And, oh, guys, I'm not gonna complain about that at all. That is a delta error now of 0.5. I mean, that's, you don't have to touch it anymore. Uh, let's take a quick look at green. Uh, green is oversaturated, the, the luminance is okay. So let's fix the, uh, let's fix the green, um, sorry, the green saturation. We're gonna now go over to green. And we're going to pick the saturation control. And because it's oversaturated, we're going to lower it. Watch the dot. Watch the delta C graph. Lower, lower, lower. And a couple more clicks. And bam. Perfect. Now our delta error went down to 1.4. We fixed it in 20 seconds. It's definitely worth the time. Okay. Now the secondary colors. Um, cyan is already a 0.2. I'm not going to touch it. Magentas need some need some love. Yellow is a 1.2. It's a little oversaturated. Um, I might fix that just to just because the the graph will be a little bit better, but it's still within a good tolerance. So uh, let's start with magenta. And what's wrong with it? It's uh, too dark and a little too blue. So primary colors. I said before, the the luminance is the most important thing. And just think about it. If I'm wearing a, if I'm dressed up like Santa Claus in a red suit and I'm in a movie theater, when the lights are on, you can see my red suit, you can see it's red, no big deal. Now the lights go off, I'm in a pitch black room, I don't know what color the red suit is. Without light, you don't see color. So you have to get the luminance right on the primary colors or everything's going to look whacked out. It's the opposite for the secondary colors. On the secondary colors, it's more important to get the dot in the hole, AKA the X and Y nailed down, and then worry about the luminance. So we're gonna kind of do this in the opposite order. So we're doing magenta, and we're going to first fix the saturation control. So 
let's pick magenta in the menu. And then let's lower the saturation. It's a little oversaturated now. Watch the delta C graph and watch the dot. Delta C graph's getting tighter and tighter. Oh, wow. Check out the gamut luminance graph too, guys. Let me put magenta back where it was. As I lower the saturation, it's also raising the lightness or luminance. So this might be a situation where two birds, one stone type of thing. Um, the luminance is still looking good. The saturation is getting better, uh, almost perfect. Let's tighten up the hue, maybe just a smidgen. And there's the hue is basically bang on. The saturation drifted just a little bit. Now it's fixed. Now let's fix the lightness. It's a little too bright still. We're going to come down. Ooh, one click. That's it. That's all it took. Now magenta is a one point. I'm sorry. A oh, wow. A 0.14 on the delta error. Excellent. Very, very good. Okay, what else is going on? Cyan's good. Not going to touch it. I did mention yellow is a little oversaturated. I'm just going to fix that so I uh, don't lose any sleep tonight. Let's pick yellow in the menu. And then let's lower the saturation just a little bit. This is the kind of stuff that you really have to nail down in a professional environment. You know, in a professional environment, we're going to work on this until the delta errors are as low as possible, uh, hopefully all under one. Uh, but, you know, in a real world scenario, in a, in, a, in, a, in a living room type situation, the delta error of 2.9 versus 0.9, unless you work for Pantone and get your eyes color tested every year and you've done it for 30 years, most people are not going to see that. Okay, let's get that saturation control a little bit lower. Now we have the yellow saturation completely under control. Okay, awesome. Guys, the color gamut looks sweet. Before I move on, we just did a white balance adjustment and we just did a color gamut adjustment. Don't move on until you look at something because test patterns are test patterns. Numbers are numbers. At the end of the day, trust your eyes. If the, if the, if, if the light meter and cow man are telling me that the grayscale is perfect, but I pull up a grayscale test pattern and it looks green, who do you trust? Trust your eyes, especially if it's a green issue. So let's pull up a grayscale before we move on. I like to use the gray step 16 because it shows me 16 different steps of gray. There's also a ramp in there as well, which is a, is a more of a smoother transition. Um, but yeah, so I'm not seeing any discrepancies. Uh, dark gray looks dark gray, middle gray looks good. White looks good. If I, saw, if I saw some pink or green or blue in here, then uh, it's something we would need to address. No big deal. That all looks great. Now, as far as the color gamut goes, you can look at two things. Uh, of course, you always have the Simpty color bars, which again, if you've looked at these a lot, you can tell by looking at them, most things are okay. That looks pretty good, but uh, I really also like to look at the skin tone test pattern that we looked at before, which is this one right here. And as I'm looking at the skin tones from straight on, and I'm looking at the primary and secondary colors that make up their clothing, everything looks nice. Um, there are a couple of newer um, skin tone test patterns that I really like. Um, you can find those from Greg at the Professional Video Alliance. Um, and I believe, uh, Greg, and you may correct me here, I believe some of those patterns are on maybe the Spears disc. Please correct me if I'm wrong there, but um, they're HDR and really, really nice. Um, Really, really nice uh, test patterns. Jared asks, uh, average calibration session. Uh, we're talking a lot <laughs> as I'm giving instruction here. Um, it, it really depends on what I'm doing. Uh, I'll give you an example of one I did a few weekends ago. Uh, it was LG OLED, uh, bright living room, uh, and he was also a gamer and also watched HDR and also watched Dolby Vision. So we did a day mode and night mode for SDR. Um, I calibrated HDR and HDR game mode. And then we calibrated Dolby Vision and a Dolby Vision game mode. So that's what, like six different modes. Um, I scheduled it for four hours. And I think I was there for a little over four hours. If I'm left alone and the customer like leaves, goes in the other room and says, hey, let me know when you're done. Uh, it's more like two and a half to about three and a half hours. Uh, I like to spend some time showing the customer test patterns and kind of explaining it to them, especially the customers that are a, a, a little more into this. Uh, they like to geek out with this kind of stuff, so I'm, I'm happy to do that with them. But if I'm doing my own TV at home or if I'm left alone in a client's home and he just says, hey, let me know when you're done, uh, maybe two, maybe three hours to do 
four, five, six modes or so. Just depends on how much work needs to be done. And then let's see, is that the, uh, oh, Greg. Okay, good, thank you. Greg says uh, that those test patterns are on his disk. So thank you for that, Greg. Uh, he gave us this email address, Greg with two Gs, G-R-E-G-G -G, at PVA.TV. And if you order it from him, uh, shameless plug for Greg, but if you order it from him, uh, he'll give you a 20% discount on the disc. So awesome. Thank you, Greg. Okay, cool. Uh, color gamut looks great. Grayscale looks great. Test patterns look great. I'm very happy with the way this is turning out. We've only got a couple more things to check. Somebody asked before, when do you adjust brightness and contrast? Well, yes, <laughs> you adjust it at the beginning and adjust it at the end. First, let's look at the saturation sweeps. I kind of talked about this before. We're going to look at each color and how it tracks. This is the first pattern there. We're going to look at each color and how it tracks from white all the way out to 100% saturation. This gives us an idea of how linear that color is. Now, there's a good audio analogy here. I like to use audio analogies. What's more important in audio? The top end way up at 20K or the bottom end way down at 20 hertz or the middle. The middle is always the most important thing, right? So if I calibrate each color at 100% saturation, but it screws up the middle, I don't think I want to do that. And as we talked about before, if I change the target from 100% saturation to 75% saturation, that might help things kind of land and line up in a, in a slightly better place. But let's take a reading first. Let's see how it looks. Okay, there's white. It's going to map out red first. Guys, here we go. Perfect example. Perfect example. Now, without going into the menu and changing the target, on this page, there's a real easy way to change the target, and I'll show you when it's done. But green so far looks pretty good. Uh, blue's a little undersaturated in the midtones, just like red is. Maybe magenta is too. But look at 100% magenta. It's bang on. Same thing happens with red. It's bang on, but the middle tones are a little whacked out. Yellow doesn't look bad. Um, if I were going to address this, I would certainly address red. It's a very important color to content. Um, and I probably would adjust magenta a little bit too. So how do you do that? Well, we did the CMS earlier at 100% saturation. I want to crank that down. So in the bottom left here, Calman, I'm going to hit this menu. Uh, we're going to pick red. And then I'm going to pick 80% instead of 100%. So we're going to pick 80% start the meter now we're looking at this dot right here and now the three delta graphs tell us what's going on at 80 percent so at 80 percent let's see what happens advanced color adjustment per color adjustment we're going to pick red and this is a saturation issue, we're gonna raise it. Now watch the 80% red dot and also watch the delta C graph. Better, better, better. Three clicks is all it took. So we came down four clicks, I wanna say, at 100% saturation, raised it two or three clicks, 80% is now looking good. Now, here's the million dollar question. Did fixing 80, fix other things or did it make things worse? I don't know, we gotta take some measurements. So I'll just do it real quick like this. Instead of doing a read series and looking at all the colors again, I'm just gonna do a quick uh, measurement of each level. So 20%, the play button will just take one reading one time, 40%, play button, 60%, play button, 80%, play button, and 100%, play button. What do you guys think? A little tighter? I think it's a lot tighter. Now, here's the trade-off though. 100% red is now a little oversaturated. That was the problem we started off with at the beginning. Red had always been oversaturated. So here's one of those judgment calls that you have to make. Am I okay with leaving 100% red slightly oversaturated, but that means the middle tones are good? Or do I want 100% saturation to be good if that makes the mid-tones undersaturated? 
if I had to pick between those two scenarios, I'm taking scenario number one. Red's a little oversaturated, not the end of the world. At least it's not undersaturated, at 100%, I should say. The last thing you want is for a Ferrari to be on the screen and it looks pink. It, it would be terrible. But if the Ferrari is slightly oversaturated, that actually might look kind of cool, right? I mean, yeah, it's not perfect and it's not to reference, but if living with a small error at 100 means that there's smaller errors in the middle, if you have to make that trade off, I think it's worth it. Let's see if there's a question. Oh, Greg was just saying, um, oh, Greg, I thought you meant, sorry, Greg was saying that the uh, diversified video solutions, the DVS disc, Greg's patterns are on that disc. So thank you, Greg, for that clarification. Um, uh, yeah, again, okay, yeah, 20% off if you uh, order it from the website. Okay, sweet. Um, okay, for the sake of time, I'll move on, but you guys get the point. If we wanted to fix magenta, we probably could. I'm gonna stick with this red. I think that's a little bit better than having 100% perfect, but the middle tones are, are a little over, a little under. I'll take that, awesome, let's go next. Now we're gonna recheck things we've already done. Black level, white level. Did they stay the same? Let's look at the contrast pattern. And I can still see 253, sweet, no changes. I look at the brightness pattern. I can still see 17, awesome. Don't have to touch anything. We might run the clip test just to be safe. I'm sure it's gonna be fine, but you never know until you try. Now remember guys, at the beginning when we did the clip test, the red, green, and blue lines were like more separated, but now that we've done the white balance, they're pancaked or sandwiched together. This is awesome. Not only is it tracking basically perfect, but the red, green, and blue are smashed on top of each other. So that means we have really good luminance, good gamma, at least on the top end. Um, I'm sure the rest of it's fine too. And it's nice and linear, good white balance. There's no deviation of red, green, or blue here. This is excellent. All right, another question. Let's check that. Uh, Jared says, is there a way to fix the red or is it a trade-off only? Jared, yes, you absolutely could fix red. In fact, if you wanted to get real crazy, you could fix that entire color gamut to thousands of points if you want to. But here's the trade-off for that. Bring your wallet, probably your checkbook, because there are external video processors that use a slightly different method called lookup tables. Um, Feel free, read about it. It's it's a bit of an explanation, but but basically you can adjust the TV up to thousands and thousands of different points if you want to. Uh, in fact, I should back that up. You're not actually adjusting the TV, you're adjusting the, the processor box. Um, some of them come in really big, really big uh, extravagant, uh, you know, 10 inputs, four outputs, so it's like a switch and a processor at the same time. And then there's other smaller ones that's just a little magic box that you, uh, plug in first, uh, I'm sorry, you plug in last before you plug into the TV. Then you calibrate the, the little box itself and now all of your dots and stuff line up perfect. Uh, but again, these are not inexpensive uh, processors. Um, now on a TV like this, where it was three, four, five grand, and maybe you can get one of those processors for let's say under a thousand dollars, it might be worth it. You know, that might be something that you wanna do. But you know, if you're buying a thousand dollar TV, I doubt I doubt, some, I doubt that's something you wanna do uh, there. Um, I do. 100% of the time, um, well, 99.999% of the time, I would almost always recommend one of those processor boxes for a projector system, mainly because they do some more cool stuff with HDR, like better tone mapping and, and a few other things too. So in a, project, a projection system, I, I do like to recommend those. If it's a pl flat, flat panel like this, and it's really used for critical viewing, uh, yeah, you might wanna do that. But, you know, average person, even if it's a dark room, watching normal content, you know, these little tiny anomalies that we're seeing are not a, a, not a big deal. Uh, Ladislav, great to see you. Thanks for coming. Uh, he mentions that the LG OLEDs use the lookup table method. Absolutely, they sure do. Um, Sony, when you do AutoCal, does not. It's just making these adjustments that we're doing manually makes them, uh, it makes them uh, on their own. So, yeah, good call. Uh, the 3D LUT system is built into the LG OLEDs. Very good. Okay, clip test looks good, brightness and contrast look good. Now the luminance, remember we set it to like 160 nits or so, hoping, hoping for like 150 at the end. Let's take a reading, 142, good. I'm still within that kind of ballpark where I wanted to be. Remember I said I wanted to be between like 120 and 150, we're at 142, I'm not gonna touch it, I'm very happy with that. 
stop the meter, move on. Now, uh, you might be wondering, like, what if it's too high or too low now? Um, you can adjust the backlight, or in Sony language, the brightness. Um, just be careful, though, because if you adjust that, it might have other consequences. So if you do adjust the backlight, you know, 10 clicks up to get a bit brighter, you're probably going to want to go back and check things like your black level, make sure it didn't do anything weird to the gamma, make sure it didn't do anything weird to the white balance either, or the color gamut for that matter. But we're still in that same area where we wanted to be, so we'll hit next. Now at this point in Calman, if we're happy with everything so far, we can click this post calibration button. If I do want to go back and make more adjustments, like maybe because I raised the backlight, I can click back to display settings and the workflow will start over again and, and we can make more adjustments. But I'm very happy with this so far, so we'll click post calibration. And now we're going to get the saturation sweeps one more time. This is what's going to go on the report at the end. So let's look at the saturation sweeps. Red looks excellent. We knew that because we fixed it. Magenta is still going to be a little off, but again, it's okay. It's fixable, but I don't want to keep you guys here for, <laughs> for too long. Again, if I was dealing with a paying customer, then yes, of course. But you see how easy it is to fix. You know, pick 80% instead, line that up, and then the rest of it should be good. Yeah, magenta is about the same. But it's funny though, because look at 100% magenta, it's like bang, right, right there in the middle of the, of the square. So good. The saturation sweeps look pretty good. That's going to come up on the report at the end. This next test is interesting. This is the color checker test. Um, you guys have, may have heard of Pantone before. Um, Pantone is like, uh, how do I describe them? They're like the, uh, uh, they're like kind of the encyclopedia of of color. The, they uh, they work in many different industries. They work in, in video, like what we're doing here. Um, they mainly work in like things like textiles and, and print and things like that. So let's say, for example, you're a, you work at BMW and you're in charge of the color of the interior of that car. Um, you know, you don't want one car with a, 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 a blue interior next to another car with a blue interior and the blues are different. You know, you want consistently consistency throughout, you know, every single blue interior of that model line, right? So Pantone sort of like manages or sort of owns, I guess, for lack of a better term, what that actual blue is. So when you're going and you're looking at like paint swatches at Home Depot and, and that kind of thing, this is all standardized stuff. So this test right here is a bunch of like purposefully picked Pantone colors, and it's mainly colors that exist in nature. So we're really going to take a look at certain things like skin tones or the color of the sky or the color of some foliage or some flowers. And this is really like, I, I call it a torture test for the TV. So if I throw out a specific um, value for like a specific skin tone, is the TV reproducing that color correctly? And that's really what this test is all about. So let's do a read series and see how it goes. White's perfect. We knew that. That's excellent. Now you'll start to see all these uh, dots, if you will, um, sort of start to land in their respective targets. Another graph I really look at here is the uh, is the the uh, the delta graph. Um, again, we're in DE two thousand, but you can set this up however you like. Um, there's a, a number two right here and a number four right here. So as long as all of these colors are kind of in the middle of that and lower, I'm going to be pretty happy. Uh, in fact, some of these colors are very, very good, and they're underneath two and even in some cases underneath one. It looks like so far there is kind of a yellow color that's a little taller or a little bit of a worse air than the rest of them so far. But as I hover my mouse over it, I can see the delta air, and it's still only a two. So that's awesome. I'm, I'm going to be real, real happy with that. There's really no need to adjust any, anything more. If we look at the skin tones, those are all under two as well. So, you know, if, if you're watching the news or you're watching a, a movie and, you know, you, there, two people are talking to each other and or you're looking at a group of people uh, with, with these kind of numbers, the skin tone should be really, really nice. So there's the color checker. Now we're going to put in the settings. Um, normally, yes, record all, record all the settings. Um, you need to have the, the customer and you need to have a, a, a record or documentation of what the settings are. Because God forbid somebody comes into this TV and resets it or, or some weird thing happens to where the settings get lost. It's way easier to look at a, a spreadsheet or to look at a, a, 
a report like this and say, okay, well, the picture got reset, no need to cry over it, we know all the numbers, so let's go through. Okay, the mode was custom, the color temperature was expert one, the gamma was minus two, the backlight was five, you know, so on and so on and so on. So normally I would go through and fill all this stuff in, but for the sake of time, uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and, and skip most of this. I'm just gonna put custom as, oops, custom as the picture mode. Um, something else you might wanna do too, I've seen this plenty of times over the years, um, as you're going through the different menus on the TV, I have seen calibrators before take out their smartphone and just take pictures of each of each menu. That's cool too, but there has to be some sort of documentation of what the settings are. Okay, now this is the final read, post calibration. I have a feeling this will be really nice. RGB balance is super tight. The luminance, the yellow line at the bottom left, you can't even see the gray line. The gray line is the measured line. The yellow line is the target, and they are like smashed on top of each other, which is really cool. Uh, let's see, red, green, blue, cyan, yellow, magenta. Uh, primary and secondary colors, guys. Bang, 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 all good. The luminance errors are super small. Um, the overall errors are, let's see, the worst, <laughs> the biggest error is blue at a whopping 1.4, that's awesome. The lowest error, the lowest error is magenta at 0.14. Now remember, that's assuming this target, which is 100%. If we measured 80, the delta error would be a little bit higher and we would probably wanna recalibrate magenta at 80, but we've already talked about that and you know, feel free, you can do it if you'd like. Okay, that's it for SDR. Now the good news is HDR takes little to no time, especially on the Sony, because when you white balance SDR, it's supposed to transfer over to HDR. So remember in SDR, the color temperature was expert one. So when we go into HDR and we put that mode into expert one for the color temperature, the white balance should be bang on. So we'll see. The other thing we have to think about in HDR <clears throat> is the EOTF and we have to see and make sure it's tracking correctly. If it's not, we could run into some really strange problems with HDR. So let's do this. We're gonna change the workflow. Oh, and by the way, if you wanna see it, at the end of this whole entire thing, this is what the customer ends up seeing. There's a report, let me actually generate it again. Okay, view report. We're gonna save the session with that name. And then from here, we can generate this into a PDF and you know, email it to the customer. Or if, if it's your TV, maybe save the PDF on your computer and there you go. I've actually had, uh, I've actually had some customers in the past, a couple guys who had like these just real big, giant, real cool, nice, nice, nice systems. Um, for a couple of those guys, I've actually like printed out the report for them and uh, they'll keep it like, you know, somewhere in their theater room so they can like show it off to, to their friends and stuff which I think is really cool. Uh, the other thing I've done for people before in the past, um, with, with again, with these big, almost like reference grade type theaters, um, they uh, you can go to any trophy store and have like a plaque made. So, you know, you walk into the theater room and maybe there's some movie posters and stuff and there's a plaque up there that says, you know, this theater has been calibrated to, you know, Rec 709 and da, da, da. So some people really geek out on this stuff and I think that's super cool myself. Okay, there's the reporting. Let's switch workflows into the HDR workflow, and this should be pretty painless. We're gonna to go to HDR manual calibration. Again, because we're doing this manually, we're gonna use the manual workflow. Uh, if we were doing auto cal, we would use the Sony specific workflow. But again, people ask us to do this uh, manually, so here we are. Okay, HDR calibration, we'll start here. Now the biggest thing that everyone forgets here is you have to uh, reconfigure the generator to output an HDR signal. Um, if you get halfway through this HDR thing and realize that the generator is still in SDR, you're gonna have to nuke that picture mode and start over from the beginning. So let's open up the settings for the generator. I'm gonna change this to 10% windows because it is HDR. We're gonna set the resolution to 4K. I'll just pick 4K24. It's common and it saves bandwidth. We're gonna still use 444 for the color space, and then we're gonna change the bit depth to 10, and we're gonna turn the HDR 
onto HDR10. And what happens sometimes, yep, it did it again. The bit depth kicked back down to eight. I've noticed this before. I gotta go back and change that to 10. So now we're good. 10% Windows, 4K24, 444, 10 bits, HDR's on. Sweet. Ready to go. Step three is find display. We're not doing auto so we're not gonna worry about it. Okay, now our targets. D65 for the white point, Rec 2020 for the color gamut, and we're doing ST2084, which is the PQ curve, which is what we're doing for HDR. Those default settings are good. Uh, to the delta error conversation that we were having before, it even tells you right here in the HDR workflow, for maximum accuracy, pick DEITP. Uh, for um, improved speed, but less accuracy, you can pick ICTCP. So we're gonna stick with, uh, we'll, we'll stick with ITP on this one, uh, which is totally fine. We'll have to change it, I uh, believe it's up here. And bear with me just a moment. I know it's in one of these menus. <laughs> there it is. Okay, cool, it's already an ITP by default in this workflow, sweet, okay, easy. All right, pre-calibration capture. Um, what I'm not sure of at the moment is what picture mode is the TV in? And it is in, okay, it's in standard, and we get an HDR logo up there, that's good. So, oh no, it's actually, this TV's funny, you guys may have noticed, when you go into the menu, the picture will like get bright for a second, and then go back to where it's supposed to be. And I think what's happening is when you go into the menu, the TV goes back into standard mode until you exit the menu, and then it's back into your mode you calibrated. Kind of weird, I don't know if that's intentional or not, or. If it is intentional, I don't know why they would do it, but that's what happens. So, guys, we did SDR Expert One in custom. I'm sorry, we did SDR in custom picture mode with Expert One as the color temperature. Now we're in HDR. We have the picture mode on custom, and the color temperature is still in Expert One. Good. Let's measure this and see, you know, see how it goes. The idea is that you don't have to do anything. SDR transfers over to HDR, but again, I've seen it not do that sometimes. But that is that is the intention, and I appreciate it because I've been screaming this for a long time. Like, why do we have to calibrate the TV five different times? It, it, we don't do that in audio. You know, you don't calibrate a, a room for Dolby Digital and then recalibrate it for DTS. You don't do that. You calibrate it one time, you set your levels, and you do what you need to do, and it covers everything, right? So what we're really aiming for here is calibrate the TV one time in one mode, and then everything transfers over to all the other formats. And with Sony doing it like this now, it's actually pretty good. It's actually pretty close. Um, other TVs, not so much. LG, for example, you do have to calibrate each one of those modes individually. Let me check the question box. Looks like one came in. Jared says, do you need to turn off local dimming for uh, full array full array local dimming screens? Um, you can, but you don't have to. And, and here's the kind of uh, uh, devil's advocate to that point. If you're watching TV with local dimming on, why would you not calibrate it with local dimming on? Does that make sense? Um, if you're going to watch it one way, you should calibrate it that way too. And, and this might be... If you've been around for a long time doing this, that might be sort of a newer concept because it, what we had to do on older TVs, if they had local dimming, especially the first couple of generations, you had to turn the local dimming off because the, the, the math and the algorithms back then weren't very good. So depending on the luminance and level of the test pattern that was on the screen, the local dimming would either, either like way overdo it or way underdo it. So what we used to do back then is we would turn the local dimming off, calibrate the TV, and then turn the local dimming back on at the end. Luckily, we don't have to do that much anymore. On this TV and other nice LCDs that I've run into, you can leave the local dimming on to whatever uh, setting you leave it on and then just calibrate it from there. The other thing I'll mention to you too is that the, the local dimming settings can be a little deceiving. So like you might notice a massive difference when you go from off to low. I mean, that's going to be a huge jump, right? And then you go low to medium, and it's like, okay, that's even a little bit better. You know, it's, it's a su more subtle change, but the blacks are a little bit deeper. The blooming's a little bit better, things like that. And then you go from like low to high, and there's no difference at all. 
Don't know why it's like that, but it is. But yeah, nine times out of 10, you're gonna end up using either the low or the middle setting, especially on a TV like this. Um, some TVs, you cannot turn off the local dimming, like Samsung's. So you have to use full fields for those TVs. So there's a couple of little gotcha moments and a couple of little rules of thumb, but in general, if you're gonna watch a TV with local dimming on, calibrate it with local dimming on. Okay, now let's look at the HDR results. Holy moly, guys. RGB balance graph, it's not as tight as it was in SDR, but it's tight. The EOTF tracks perfectly. I don't have to do anything to this. This is HDR, this is really good HDR. Now our overall luminance calibrated is 1,745 nits. Guys, this is awesome. We're really close to 2,000. Now this TV is now, I wanna say like two years old. Some of the newer ones, we're seeing numbers like 3,800 nits. So we're kind of getting closer to that 4,000 nit sort of um, stepping zone before we get to 10,000. Remember guys, the, the most common um, the most common monitors that all this HDR stuff are, is graded on are either 1,000 nit, 4,000 nit, 10,000 nit. So as we're getting closer to that 1,000 nit range in OLEDs and, and maybe smaller size screens and stuff, um, I think 1,000 is going to be a really good kind of minimum. The next target will be 4,000. We're starting to see some TVs do that now. And then the ultimate target will be 10,000, which we might not see for, for several years. Um, the good news is, though, is that we have seen some Sony prototype panels at trade shows in secret blacked out rooms that are 10,000 nits. And it might be you might be thinking like, God, 10,000 nits. Are you crazy? Like that's like that's like putting your face in front of a, your headlights of your car. Right. But don't think of it like that. Think of it as extra headroom. So, A, you don't have to push the TV so hard because it already does 10,000 nits. And it looks more. You know, we've always had this saying, especially when HD first came out in the 90s, we always had this saying of like, oh my gosh, it looks like you're looking out of a window, right? But that was never true. Uh, the resolution wasn't high enough. The dynamic range wasn't high enough. The color wasn't saturated enough. But, you know, it was great at the time. But now, as we're getting closer to 10,000 nits and Rec 2020, now that whole thing about looking out the window is actually becoming more and more true every time we, we make these big improvements. So, um, 10,000 nits might sound bright, but it's it's not. You have to remember these are specular highlights. So if 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 there's a flash of uh, if the sunlight flashes off of a chrome bumper for a split second, that might be 10,000 nits for two frames, right? But when a car passes you and you see that reflection off the bumper, it only lasts for what a second maybe. So you we are actually starting to get to more of this like real life type of uh, type of situation with these TVs. Uh, looks like there's a question. Uh, do you need to adjust the backlight to a certain nit range for HDR? Um, so Jared, in, in most cases, you'll see that almost every single TV, in fact, every TV I can think of right now, when you're in HDR, the backlight's already maxed out, the uh, contrast is already maxed out, and everything else is usually at the factory setting. The problem with making those adjustments in HDR is you can throw off this EOTF curve and line, I should say, and you might end up with mid-tones being too bright or mid-tones being too dark. The way it's tracking right now is perfect. So even if the backlight was down to like 90 instead of 100, if I raise the backlight to 100, we might get, we might have some issues with that EOTF, but it's tracking perfect right now. And then let's just double check. I'm pretty sure the brightness and the, uh, I'm sorry, the, the black level and the contrast, um, the backlight and the contrast, I should say, are already maxed out. So let's see. Brightness, aka backlight, is maxed out. Oh, actually, you know, the contrast is still at 88 from, from our SDR, but it's tracking well, so I'm not gonna touch it. So the big things I'm looking for here are the white balance and the tracking, and both of them are doing an excellent job right now. And the fact that this is calibrated and still is 1,745 nits, and it's a two-year-old TV, this is cool. Um, if I had, how do I say this? Um, my living room is much brighter than my bedroom where my dark OLED with the black wall is I was telling you guys about. If I had to put a TV in the living room where I do have bigger windows and white walls and a white ceiling, this would be on my short list for sure. Excellent TV, excellent performance. Uh, when we look at actual content here, it it it's, it screams. Those, uh, those bright highlights that are up in that 1,000 
plus knit range. Um, it, it, it's just stunning. I mean, you look at a sunset or something and it looks, you actually have gradations between bright and dark and uh, with, with all this extra headroom and more color and stuff, I look at a movie like Black Panther. There's some dark scenes in that movie where the, the costumes and the clothing that the characters are wearing are still like these deep saturated purples and reds and whatnot in dark scenes. So having that much extra dynamic range and having that much extra color really helps with a lot of that stuff. Because traditionally, if you watch a dark scene in a movie, that purple outfit that person's wearing starts to kind of blend in with the black. It's tough. But if you can see a dark purple jacket or a dress in a really dark scene, you can thank HDR and wide color gamuts for that type of stuff. So guys, th this is kind of what I wanted to show you is that when, when Sony changed it to where calibrating SDR means you already calibrated HDR, this is exactly what I wanted you guys to see. So I think that's it. Um, there are a couple of reference test images for HDR. Um, of course, once you finish calibrating and looking at numbers and all that fun stuff, you know, don't just pack up your gear and walk away. Look at some images that you know well. Um, I carry a book of discs with me. I always have and always will. Um, I like to put in a disc. I have some things on a thumb drive. And the generator I'm using right now actually has uh, at least one HDR reference image in it. Let's see if I can find it real quick. Lots of test patterns, lots of test patterns, lots of test patterns. Oh, you know what? Actually, that image is not on this generator. That's okay. The point of the story is uh, when you're um, after you're calibrating, all your numbers look good, you're happy with everything, pop in a disk that you know well. If the customer doesn't have a disk player, you know, toss in a thumb drive with some really high quality content on it. Look at the HDR, point out the details, point out the skin tones. And guys, it's getting to a point now where like I was watching, there's a, um, there's a really, I think it's cool. There's a really uh, a cool show on Netflix called uh, Nailed It. And it's like this baking show. And um, they have these professional bakers. They'll make these like really extravagant like cakes and stuff for like birthday parties and weddings and things like that. And these amateur bakers have to like reproduce this thing and they only have so much time and it usually ends up a total mess and it's it's funny and it's it's kind of cool. But um, that is in Dolby Vision, right? And it's not like this overly crazy special effects movie like Transformers or you know any of the Marvel things or anything like that. This is just like a normal looking show in normal studio lighting. And guys, the, the colors and the skin tones and, you know, when they're putting like red frosting on a cookie or something, everything just looks so much more realistic. It's very, very cool. And it spoils us. I mean, I'm definitely spoiled. I'll go from watching that show to something in SDR and I'm like, ugh, this is boring. It's flat. It's undersaturated, yada, yada, yada. But for SDR, in reality, it's very, very good. But if you've been staring at HDR for an hour or two and you go back to SDR, you, your perspective totally changes on that. So anyway, long story short. Um, thank you guys for hanging out this long. I know we didn't quite schedule it this long. These sessions tend to run a little longer, so I really thank you guys for, for hanging out. Um, guys, the questions, Tom, Greg, Jared, a lot of, everybody who tossed out questions to me, thank you. Uh, certain things I, you know, I don't remember everything all the time, so you guys were really a big help there. Some of those tips that you gave everybody, I'm sure will, I'm sure will stick. So if you guys do any have, uh, do you have any last minute questions? I'm happy to hang out for a few more minutes. It looks like one did just come in. And ah, Thomas just said thank you. Okay, cool. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, feel free, man. If you guys have any questions or uh, any recommendations as far as like what you want to see us do, you know, feel free, guys. Email me, jason at meridio.com. In fact, I'll put it up on the screen here so you can see it. Um, another thing that I'm working on right now is uh, I want to do like a, like a like a ask me anything type of series um and i've kind of tweeted this out and and you know let people know that i want to do it and what i really want to do is um i want people to send in questions and then i want to answer them like in a few minutes in a simple way and just do like a youtube series out of it i think that'd be cool i think that'd be fun um i haven't gotten any questions yet so if you guys have any questions that you just have you know general questions that i can maybe answer for you um, in a simple way, send them to me, jason at meridio.com. Once I start getting some questions in, I'll probably do like a weekly thing. Hey, this question comes from Jared. He says, yada, 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 yada. And here's my answer. Um, I want to do that kind of stuff for you guys. You know, my whole shtick here is, is spreading the knowledge and spreading the love of 
not only the equipment, but the, the process of making all these things look and sound nice. So um, guys, again, thank you so much. Let me just double check the questions one more time. Thomas says, any discounts on new gear? Thomas, if you go through um, any of the calibration classes, then yes, we do give a discount on students who go through the classes. Uh, we do also do some periodic things like trade-ins and stuff like that. So if you're on Facebook, check out the Facebook page for Meridio. We also have a, a Twitter. Um, I run the Twitter page. So, you know, if you guys have anything there that you that you want to see, you can always message me there or uh, my email is on the screen right now. Real simple, jason at meridio.com. Guys, feel free, send in questions. Let me know what I can help with. Um, Thomas says, I'm ISF certified, but I could use a refresher. Thomas, that's a lot of people are in that boat right now, especially over all the years. Um, there is a discount if you're an alumni. So if you've taken ISF before, you want to take it again, you do get a discount there. And because you take the class, you do get a discount on the gear as well. Uh, Jared says, have I calibrated any high knit Vizio PQs? Yes. Um, there's the Quantum X, I think it's called. A uh, gentleman down in the Naples area reached out to me a couple months ago. And uh, he told me he got this TV and he read about calibration. I went down and did it for him. Um, I think it turned out pretty good. Um, it wasn't like this Sony, but it still turned out pretty good. Uh, the good news is, is that it looked really nice. Um, and ironically enough, it's funny you ask this, I got an email from him like two nights ago. And this was six months ago, probably, when I did the job. He emails me a couple nights ago and he says, hey man, just wanted to say hi. The TV still looks awesome. My buddy came over the other night. He has the same TV and he's pissed that his doesn't look like mine. And I'm like, good, that's exactly like what we're going for here. So, you know, this is, uh, again, this is all fun stuff. I love it. You guys obviously love it too. Uh, feel free, reach out, any questions, uh, send some questions to me uh, for that Ask Me Anything series. I'd love, to, uh, I'd love to see you guys in future webinars. So if you want to see something specific, uh, I haven't done a Samsung yet. So if you guys want to see a Samsung, send that, send that to me and uh, we'll definitely consider that for our, for our monthly series here. So cool. Don't want to run too, uh, too, don't want to rant too long here, guys. Thanks again so much. Uh, oh, one more thing. Charles says, uh, what are the boxes you referred to calibrate with? Charles. Okay. So what you want to look for, they're called LUT boxes, L-U-T. Some of them are standalone with just a simple HDMI in, HDMI out. Some of them are a lot more advanced. So you might want to look at something like Lumigen, or you might want to look at something like Mad VR. Um, any of those solutions will, will uh, make these calibrations basically perfect. I mean, nothing's perfect, but as close to perfection as possible. So those little dots and stuff that were slightly off in the color checker maybe, or the saturation sweeps maybe, when you use one of these boxes, bam, it is, it's perfect and good to go. Uh, Jared says another HDR manual. Cool. That might be something we do on maybe a Samsung later. So cool guys. Again, you know my email address. Feel free. Reach out. Thanks a ton for hanging out this long. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next time.